feel good? I Ready feel good. Go? All right. So <clears throat> this is Ryan Morini uh, with the Sam Proctor Oral History Program. Today is November 16th, 2017, and we're here in, the, what is this reading room called again? It, the, the Graham Center reading room that's at, um, in Pew Hall with Dr. Philip Deloria. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, could we start with your full name? Just Philip J. Deloria, J's for Joseph. Okay. Uh, and when were you born? I was born February 27th, 1959. Okay. And where? In Davenport, Iowa. Is, is that where you grew up? Or? No. My, um, that's where my grandmother on my mother's side um, mm -hmm. was living. And so my parents were there in the Quad Cities area okay. of Iowa. But I grew up mostly in Colorado. A little mm -hmm. stint in Washington State, back to Colorado, mostly in Colorado. Okay, so do you have any particular memories of Iowa or? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so I, to like jump around in my life a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually was teaching at the University of Colorado and then decided to move to Michigan. Mm -hmm. And part of it was just because I had these memories of the Midwest, uh, which were childhood memories of Iowa and the Mississippi River and the Rock River and the trees and the kind of Midwestern humidity. And um, so, you know, we visited Iowa kind of every summer, you know, mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was a kid. Um, and uh, I, was, I have a, little, a few memories of living in uh, Moline, Illinois, mm -hmm. which is kind of the working class side of the river, Davenport, a little bit more the commercial mercantile side. Um, I still know where the house is where I was, you know, at. Uh, but we moved to Colorado when I was, I don't know, probably five or six years old. Okay. So what do you remember about that move? Why did you move first? Let's start there. Well, um, you know, my dad had an had a interestingly sort of uneven kind of path at that point in his life. Mm -hmm. So he had... Um, after he finished high school, he'd gone to the Colorado School of Mines for a semester, dropped out, entered the Marines, been there for two and a half or three years, gone back to Iowa State, decided he graduated from Iowa State in general studies, decided he wanted to go to graduate school, um, went out to Oregon, decided he didn't like it in Oregon, came back to um, Iowa, ended up going to seminary at Augustana College. Um, in the Quad Cities area and sort of worked at night at International Harvester. And so he was sort of on, somewhere in there. He taught a semester in Puerto Rico, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but then he got this job in Denver working for the United Scholarship Services. And uh, so then we all packed up and we moved to, to Colorado. So, and I should, so my dad, it's Vine Deloria Jr., who's mm -hmm. a prominent American intell intellectual, which is why his history actually probably matters, you know, <laughs> to the story. So we lived right next to, kind of under um, Lowry Air Force Base in Denver, um, mm -hmm. which was, in my memory, you know, not exactly a high-functioning Air Force Base, but a place with a lot of kind of activity and hustle and hustle and bustle going around. Uh, so that's a, uh, what's your first memory of Colorado when you get there? Yeah, yeah. living in a kind of small, um, pretty small apartment. Um, I remember kind of Christmas one year with a tiny tree in a kind of small apartment. Um, you know, my brother and I not really being um, super mobile, but trying to walk around the neighborhood a little bit, um, you know. And then we moved from there um, to, uh, in Denver, a place called University Park, mm -hmm. which is kind of by University of Denver. Um, so I went to University Park Elementary School in, uh, you know, in Denver. And it was an interesting, small little house. Um, there's a bunch of cool, small, old working class houses there, and this was one. And uh, what I remember about that house was it had, a, it had an unfinished basement, like a no foundation floor. So you go down in the basement and it was this dirt floor. And, um, <laughs> and it was scary, right? There was something <laughs> scary, right, about like critters are gonna come out of the dirt. You know, it's like, no, this should be concrete. Even, you know, at kindergarten I could tell, like there's supposed to be concrete here, there's not concrete here, this is weird. Uh, <laughs> So, but we were in that house for, I don't know, ah, several years. But that's the house where my dad wrote Custer Died for His Sins, which was his mm. first big book. And after that book, um, we moved, I don't know, a couple miles east in, out of the Denver Public Schools into the Cherry Creek Public Schools and uh, into a, a slightly bigger house. 
And I had a brother and a sister at that point. So this was kind of heading towards a more suburban kind of life. Okay, okay. That's, uh, w so when your dad was writing Custer Died Various Sins, like, was that, did you know much about that? Was he talking about that in the house at the time? Or did you have any awareness of what he was doing? I knew he was writing. Um, you know, so the house, the house had, like, you'd walk in, and there was, like, this little living room. And then there was like this kind of little Harry Potter closet, which was my sister's room. Mm -hmm. And then there was a little bedroom where my brother and I shared. And there was a walkthrough into my parents' little bedroom. Um, and so the only place for my dad to write was in the living room. So he basically mm -hmm. like took over the living room. And, uh, and he wrote, as he always did for the rest of his life, on a coffee table on a kind of, you know, sort of, you know, armchair thing. So he'd sit cross-legged in the armchair. And he'd lean over. This is you know, kind of why he was having back problems for much of his life. <laughs> he'd hunch over, he'd type with two fingers, two fingers and a thumb. Um, <laughs> and so he took over that room. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, we, weren't we ended up playing in the kitchen underneath the table mostly because he was, you know, he was kind of there. So we knew he was up to something. Um, and then after the book came out, we moved to the other place um, on Ivanhoe Street. Um, mm. uh, he took over half the basement. My brother and I shared a room that was right next to his, what became his office. And, uh, you know, so we could hear him typing all night. He would write all night. And uh, he was going to law school at the University of Colorado, so he would drive up to Boulder mm -hmm. in the morning, drive back, write all night, try to get up in the morning and go. So I think he missed a lot of law school classes. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we could hear him back there. And he started, that's when he started doing what would then later become with each successive house that he moved us to a larger and larger and more scholarly kind of library workspace, you know, for mm -hmm. himself. So at that moment, it was still his easy chair and his coffee table and a big table where he laid out a bunch of, you know, he was laying out documents and things like that. And later it would turn into these massive libraries every time we'd move to a new house, which didn't happen all the time, but, you know, we would, um, he would mobilize us all and we would all build homemade bookshelves into the wall on every wall of the place that was going to be his office. And, you know, we just used, you know, cheap pine boards and stuff, and we'd all build bookcases and then stain them, and it was a big family project. <laughs> so we knew whenever we were going to move. And we'd say, we're moving, Dad. Can we just take down the bookcases and, like, bring them to the next place? And he'd be like, no, no, can't do that. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, those are, those are some of my memories of that, uh, you know, of that place. That little house, you know, um, on Monroe Street in Iowa was, um, or in, in Denver was, um, I mean, that was a really, as you can imagine, right, that moment. For me, it was kindergarten through third grade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my friends were all, you know, their parents worked at Coors, you know, um, places like that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a YMCA up the hill, so we went up to the Y all the time, and we, you know, I don't know. It was a really nice landscape. There was a kind of big... Uh, water project, kind of water runoff sewage project that was built around the time and we spent a ton of time hanging around in this big concrete tunnel that was full of all kinds of gross stuff, but like this is where we <laughs> played and ran around. I don't know. It was fun. It sounds like it. So, I mean, I'm wondering, I, I mean, your dad was a pretty outspoken critic of um, a lot of how indigenous people uh, have been conceptualized and treated by the federal government and other things. Did any of that come into sort of how the discussions about what you were learning in school and things like that? I mean, were there any conversations about your textbooks and things, or was that kind of a separate thing at that time? Yeah, it was pretty separate. I mean, my dad was... Um I think, you know, his really strong commitments to the political work he was doing, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, when it's not he was an irresponsible family person or anything mm -hmm. like that, but mm -hmm. it was a separate spheres kind of, kind of thing. So my mom really did run the family and, uh, you know, took care of all the stuff that surrounded the kids. My dad pretty much did his, you know, did his thing. And, um, you know, not that the two things didn't overlap and intersect sometimes, but not intellectually that much, you know. So he hmm. was not that curious about, you know, what books we were looking at in school. He didn't hand us reading. Later, when we were older, you know, he got hmm. more interested in those things. But early on, you know, not so much. And of course, you know, his first 
his first big job when he was the director of the Ameri National Council of American Indians, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the first thing he did was he had to consolidate the organization, which had been in something of disarray. And uh, so he basically took off. He went to Washington, D.C. He slept mm -hmm. on the couch in the office for like nine months. <laughs> he came home for Christmas, and then he turned around and he went back for another, you know, four or five, six months. So he was gone a lot in that sort of, you know, in that moment when we were in that house. And then he came back and he started, uh, you know, really seriously writing, um, you know. So, um, so he was in and out a lot, and then he had a super busy travel schedule throughout the late 60s and early, early to mid-70s. He was just on the road all the time. So um, we moved in, I should have, like, look this up to get these dates better, but mm -hmm. um, ah, this is oral history. <laughs> There's a certain new precision about it, isn't there? It's I mean, if, however you remember it. Is yeah, good. well, it was 1970 or 71. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, could, I could look it up and get it completely straight in my head. Um, you know, I remember this because there were ad campaigns that like, the 70s, welcome to the 70s. <laughs> wow, you know, I mean, in a way that ha captured the sort of cultural feeling of the 60s, but translated it into what would later, in retrospect, become a cultural sensibility of the 70s. You know, like <laughs> not quite the 60s, but not disco either, you know. Um, so we moved to Bellingham, Washington, because uh, he, so my dad, interestingly, he took a job as a lecturer. Um, so this was his first foray into academic stuff at mm -hmm. what was in, um, Western Washington um, State College, which is now Western Washington University, um, in Bellingham. So, you know, he was, it was basically a kind of, you know, adjunct job. Mm. But I don't think he really understood that, that was what, what it was. So we picked up the whole family. We moved to Bellingham, Washington, and um, where we lived in a great house on Bayon Road, um, which is, is, was this big old it had been, this had been a farm. Um, the farmer had been really successful. So he'd built a kind of moddy house, you know, a 60s mod house. Um, and he'd put in a fish pond, and he, but there was a beautiful old barn and tons of fields and a Christmas tree lot with a big pile of sawdust. I mean, it was like great. And then he'd built himself another house, like just, you know, a quarter mile up the road and then moved into that house. So we always had the farmer looking over our shoulder, the successful farmer looking over our shoulder at what we were doing to the house. And, and it was a big, big rambly house with old storerooms and, you know, all this kind of stuff is great. Hmm. Cherries and blackberries. And so we spent a lot of time running around outside um, <laughs> there. So it was, I mean, it was, I loved it. I loved it in Bellingham. Um, but after a couple of years, my dad realized like, oh, <laughs> I'm just like an adjunct lecturer. <laughs> this isn't really happening. And he got a big grant from the John Hay Whitney Foundation, and he moved us all back to Colorado at that point. So, and part of it was Bellingham was super hard to travel out of. Um, so you have to fly to Seattle on these little pole jumpers. The weather was always bad. You'd have mm. to fly out of Seattle, and he was going to Washington, D.C. a lot. So the travel was kind of killing him. Like you could... I see now in retrospect how bad that was on his health, right? He was eating mm -hmm. badly, he put on weight, he was, you know, he was, it was not, the, so it was smart for him to get back to, get back mm -hmm. to Colorado. Yeah, so we moved back to Colorado in like 72, 73. Um, I know we were there in 73 because Wounded Knee uh, happened on my birthday. I remember mm -hmm. my dad getting a lot of calls, wow. um, you know, at the time. And uh, uh, yeah, so we moved into a really, uh, our houses got nicer and better. I watched my parents go from, you know, kind of working class to, um, and my, you know, in my dad's side, that was a very particular form of intellectual working class, right? So mm -hmm. two generations before him of ministers in the Episcopal Church, you know, um, people who did not get paid anything, mm -hmm. but who were kind of intellectual and thought leaders in their communities. You know, so um, they weren't industrial workers or anything like that. They weren't agricultural workers. They were intellectual workers, but, you know, they had nothing. So, um, so it was fun and interesting, like I now see in retrospect, to realize my parents had moved, you know, from a little apartment to a little tiny house to a slightly bigger house to like, oh, ruralish place with more opportunity to buy a slightly bigger house back <laughs> into Colorado with a slightly bigger house. And, you know, um, and I should say, you know, through that whole time, my, my dad was... was um, 
as my dad was writing books, selling books, um, you know, starting to make more money, um, you know, he was also really generous about stuff too. So, mm -hmm. you know, he was he would give royalties away to different things. He started this Institute for Development of Indian Law with, you know, all of his own money to try to like, you know, do a kind of tribal legal thing. Um, he, he had this when we this is when we moved back to Colorado. Um, he quite rightly thought it would be really useful for every tribe to have its own bound volume of all of its treaties. Mm -hmm. And so he collected all these treaties for all these different tribes, and he self-published, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I really mean that, um, self-published these brown volumes, um, which many people still have and use. And, but here's how he did it. You know, he, um, uh, he just took this stuff down to a printer, and he just got pages back. In, you know, and there was like, here's page one, here's page two, here's page three. And so he would bring massive stacks of boxes into the basement. I remember this, going down to these printers with my dad and like carting these boxes back. I was in junior high at the time. <laughs> carting these boxes back and taking them down in the basement. And, um, you know, and then we'd lay them all. There was, this house had been like a sort of, um, had an early 70s groove, which meant it had like a little bar down the stairs with like kind of lush carpet. <laughs> it was this really kind of gross place <laughs> in some ways. But we would lay out, you know, pages one through 15 on the bar, big stacks of them. And my brother and I would walk through one, <laughs> two, three, up through 12. We'd collate them. And then over on this other table, we'd set these stacks. And this is pages one through 12. And then we'd do 13 through 24. And this is how the book got assembled was my brother and I basically spent, you know, uh, well over a year, you know, and my dad uh, always said, I'll pay you a nickel for every completed, uh, you know, kind of volume. And most of the time he did, and sometimes he forgot. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but my dad was very good about putting my brother and I to work on those kinds of, um, you know, those kinds of projects. And, but now, you know, the result is, was this set of these, these volumes, and they're super useful. They're really, they're really great. So he, that's the kind of stuff he was doing at the same time. You know, he was moving around, trying to kind of fix himself in his own, you know, his own career. Um, and, you know, those years were really interesting, really cool years for us. He, um, he wrote a screenplay for Marlon Brando. Um, hmm. So this is, a total, this is my dad as a kind of, you know, kind of, um, you wouldn't call him a reservation kid, right? He grew up in Martin, South Dakota, but he also got ca continually shipped back to... Um, boarding school, St. James Boarding School in South Dakota, and then the Kent School in Cornwall, Connecticut, um, which mm -hmm. was a really, you know, kind of preppy sort of place. He didn't really like it that well. So he would kind of alternate between, in his high school years, between going to the Kent School and then saying, ah, oh, I just want to do a semester here in Martin, and he'd be in Martin High School, and then he'd go back to the Kent School. And so he was kind of a little bit of a back and forth. But he had a kind of reservation sensibility, which is like, oh, um, it would be really nice for us to have a nice car. Let's get a cool car. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. What would be a great car? So for him, a great car was like not a Cadillac. That would be too aspirational, right? So it was an Oldsmobile, mm -hmm. right? So there's always a series of Oldsmobiles, right, that were like aspirational cars, you know, for my dad. Always in like red or like canary yellow, you know? I mean, just, um, you know, so he, he liked that kind of, he liked that kind of stuff. So in any case, he did this movie with Marlon, he, he wrote this screenplay and sold it to Marlon Brando. And he was like, you know what would be really nice, what I've always wanted to have, then this is just money from heaven, right, is a swimming pool. So, <laughs> so he built this little swimming pool in the back of our house and, uh, and he got this plaque, because um, the movie never got made. So he got this big plaque for the thing, the Marlon Brando movie, Memorial Swimming Pool. And it was just, he just got the biggest kick out of it, you know, and he would bring people to the swimming pool. They'd sit, and you know, my dad didn't really like to swim that much, right? But he would sit by the swimming pool for a while. Um, and, you know, and there was this huge parade of really interesting people that came through. And, um, you know, a guy who became kind of his best friend over the years, Bobby Bridger, who was a kind of folk musician from Austin, Texas. Um, who did these sort of talking ballads inspired by the poetry of John Neihart. Mm -hmm. um, and then that hooked him into a whole music scene, and my dad was really into music, as I was also into music. Um, uh, so my dad had always aspired to you know, be able to play the guitar, and this is kind of one version of why he flunked out of the School of Mines is because he mm -hmm. just hung out with these beatniks sort of sitting around <laughs> trying to play guitar and <laughs> playing cards and drinking and you know, kind of carousing on West Colfax. Um, 
So in any case, he loved this guy, Bobby Bridger, who hooked him up with, connected him up with um, the Lost Gonzo Band, which was the backing band for Jerry Jeff Walker. They were like the best side men in Austin, you know, at the time. There'd been a fight sort of like, who gets the Lost Gonzo Band, Michael Martin Murphy or Jerry Jeff Walker? Jerry Jeff Walker kind of ended up with these guys who were super nice, smart guys. John Inman, who's still a producer down there, Gary P. Nunn, um, wrote the theme song for Austin City Limits. Um, you know, so this is super cool to have these guys around. And, you know, there'd be moments where um, Jerry Jeff came and played at Red Rocks one time. We all got backstage passes. We came back to the house. There was this massive party. I mean, it was, it was great as a teenager, you know, this kind of fantastic kind of moments, you know. Or he, he was doing a lot of work for um, Northwest Coast Tribes. So there were moments where... Um, you know, these guys would catch a bunch of salmon and they would say, hey, let's send some salmon to Vine. And so we get these calls like, you know, there's, uh, you know, 60 pounds salmon in a box of ice at the airport. You've got to come pick it up right now. And my dad would be like, you go, go to the, you know, go get the salmon. And I'd come back with this big box and my dad, you know, would have dug a pit in the backyard. And <laughs> now he didn't know how to do this really, right? He was just sort of like faking it, you know, but like, I, I mean, it's, you put coals in a pit and you throw some food in it, it's going to cook, right? I mean, so it wasn't like it was a flop or a failure or anything. So it was fun to watch him, you know, do those kinds of things. And he would invite, you know, lots and lots of cool, interesting people over. You know, uh, we had uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott came mm -hmm. through the house one time. His dogs tore a hole in our screen, <laughs> the screen door. And as he was on his way out, he was like, ah, damn, the dogs tore a hole in your screen. And he literally gave us a shirt, you know, here, take this shirt, you know, this will compensate for the dogs ripping the, and we were like, <laughs> and then of course now later we realized, hey, we've got Ramblin' Jack Elliott's shirt, you know, this is kind of, I don't know what, exactly what you do with it, you know, and, but it's cool <laughs> to have. I'm not quite sure we still have it. Um, or David Amram, who was a really interesting classical composer. He was the first composer in resident at the New York Phil, but he was also mm -hmm. like this great kind of crazy hippie music guy who used to walk around with like 30 flutes on strings kind of dangling world music flutes and he would pick them up and he'd play and he was a jazz uh, French horn player and you know uh, hung out with all the beats and you know I mean so it was, it was people like that. Hayami Storm, the writer um, who uh, wouldn't use a towel just dried himself with toilet paper. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, so it was just like, this is my high school life, was like being surrounded by like all this really the interesting parade of people in a really cosmopolitan way, hmm. you know? So there's a lot of native people passing through the house too, but like a lot of people who were just part of this big intellectual world, you know, that he, you know, that he imagined for himself and created, you know, created for himself. Um, so... Uh, you know, he was also uh, he was also under surveillance, right? The FBI had our phones tapped mm -hmm. at the time, so there was that part of it too. Um, and that's probably more where he was willing to start sharing with us, like, here's what I do, you know, <laughs> here's what my life is about, uh, you know. And my brother and I had so much fun, you know. We'd call our friends, we'd say like, hey, guess what? The FBI is listening to us right now, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, it was fun. It was, it was talking about street cred as a high school student, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it was good. I would imagine. It's, I mean, did you become immediately aware of the surveillance, or was that like a? Did your parents kind of break that to you later, or how did? Yeah, I mean, he found out at some point pretty early um, in after Wounded Knee, mm -hmm. right when the FBI was really ramp ramping up the COINTELPRO stuff, right? He found out <clears throat> pretty early in that that the phone that the phones were tapped, and you know, so he was both pissed off and kind of. Um, <laughs> Thought it was funny, yeah. You know, because uh, I mean, if nothing else, I mean, he um, he was, uh, you know, he was a kind of straight up, above board, uh, obey the law kind of guy, right? He never once cheated on his taxes. He, you know, I mean, like mm -hmm. he was, you know, he was the son of a preacher man, right? I mean, in a lot of ways. So, you know, um, he was a political activist and you know but he was not a guy who was out in the streets like he was not mm -hmm. the guy at the barricades he was not smuggling arms or anything like that you know he was just like a guy who wanted to bring law and bring the treaty of, of 1868 into the into the trials and into the picture then that's and that was the most dangerous thing for the government and he was successful in doing that you know so yeah it was it was a, it was an interesting moment um, 
Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. Uh, so I've, I've got a lot of questions, I guess. But um, one, if I can just add, so wounded knee on your birthday, that's, what were your thoughts at that time? Were you aware of the significance of what was going on or was? Yeah. Um, I mean, on the day, it didn't, you couldn't quite see what it was going to turn into. Mm -hmm. Like within a couple days, then like it was, you were like, oh, wow, you know, this actually really is, is something. Um, so, but my dad was never that much into anybody's birthday anyway, so it didn't really, <laughs> that part of it didn't really, didn't really matter. But you could actually, you know, I mean, so then we tracked on it in, at home quite closely, right, mm -hmm. in terms of that. And a lot of that stuff is stuff he didn't really share with us, but we, we were watching it on the news. He was watching it on the news, you know, so we were, you know, um, it was probably a moment where, um, it wasn't the first moment for sure, but it was a big moment in terms of where all of his work and the family kind of really did sort of come together, you know. Um, and I mean, the fact is, you know, by, by that point and then, and then in, the, in the years to follow, um, you know, I mean, his, his prominence became, you know, quite apparent to, you know, my brother and I in particular. And I'd say both of us kind of pressed back against that in some mm -hmm. ways, right? I mean, in our family, there's a long history of kind of Oedipal conflicts between fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. And every, gen every father reproduces it, you know, with their own generation. I've tried really hard with my own son not to do that. And I've kind of been mostly successful, but not totally, right? There's certain things that are just embodied in us that we just do. So, you know, um, so my dad did generate that, and I'd say both my brother and I, a sort of sense of like, you know, I don't really like the way you deal with us and the family. And, um, you know, I mean, as a 12 or 13 year old, 15 year old, you're not really saying like, I'm not gonna be that kind of parent, you know, but there's a kind of emotional sort of press back on that. And for me, that was like, um, I'm just going to be a musician. I'm going to be a nerd musician. So I was a trombone player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like the kid in the sensible shoes who carried a trombone to school and on the bus and got, you know, made fun of and, you know, and occasionally harassed, you know. It's just, you know, I was a band nerd, right? I was a band <laughs> nerd all the way through. Um, and my brother, you know, said, I'm going to, um, I'm going to be a, a mechanic, you know. So he was an aircraft mechanic and worked in the Arizona Air National Guard, retired from there, worked for General Dynamics. Tinker Air Force Base, and now he's back in Arizona, you know, so he's planes, airplanes has been his, his life. My sister became a math teacher in Tucson High School, Tucson, um, yeah, Tucson High School in Tucson School District. Okay. So, it, it, growing up, I mean, what kind of sense did you have of being Native and being kind of connected to Native culture? I mean, was, was there a moment in your childhood where you realized, or was it kind of a process, or what? Uh, I wouldn't say there was a moment. Um, there was sort of always moments, right? Lots mm -hmm. of moments. Um, you know, I mean, I think in some ways my dad, because he was going so deep into the kind of policy, law, activism kind of side, he set it up with set us up in relation to a certain context that as kids we couldn't really participate in. Mm -hmm. Like, how are we supposed to have a conversation about treaty rights as kids? You know, yeah. so you might imagine a kind of cultural upbringing that would be pretty different from that. And that's something we didn't really get from my dad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was a guy who was on the circuit, who was talking to people, who was visiting, you know, doing tribal, you know, visits to tribes and, and, and different places. But that wasn't bringing the family into a kind of, um, you know, a Lakota or Dakota context at all. I mean, for us, that really came from my grandfather mm -hmm. um, and uh, from, the moments when we sort of got together as a larger family. And most of those happened in South Dakota and they mostly happened at this Episcopal church um, kind of summer camp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, summer camp's not quite the right word for it. Um, it was like a retreat, you know. Okay. It was like six or eight cabins kind of that the church had, which actually over the time passed from church ownership into the ownership of private um, folks who were associated with the church. But it was called Camp Remington. It was outside of Custer, South Dakota in the Black Hills. Um, so I can remember as kids, you know, um, on the one hand, going to <coughs> um, places, church convocations, 
or we'd go visit my grandparents, you know, we'd be, and my gra grandfather would be at a lot of different churches, you know, mm -hmm. he was the archdeacon of the state of South Dakota for the Episcopal Church. So, you know, I can remember moments, a lot of these kind of Episcopal churches, which are all built on the same kind of template, right? Little tiny rural churches, you know, they've got a basement, they've got, you know, kind of a small structure like this, they're all very much the same. And I can remember being in, in multiple versions of that church, mm -hmm. you know, um, either watching my grandfather preach or, you know, doing, being, doing Sunday school down in the basement, you know, and coloring, you know, pictures of the Holy Land, <laughs> that, kind of, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Um, you know, moments where um, church convocations and we would all be camped, uh, although my dad didn't really like the camping life that much, so, you know, these things were not super common for us. Um, and then we would then, so those are sort of younger memories, and then some of the older memories would really be at, at Camp Remington. So um, mm -hmm. basically the bishop of the, the South Dakota Diocese had a cabin there, the bishop's cabin. Um, <laughs> and then there was like another cabin over here, and then a kind of community house with a couple of places to sleep, and a place called the nunnery, and then this little chapel up on the hill, which was really beautiful and wonderful, and then a couple of little places spread around. There was a big stream that kind of ran through. There was a giant outcropping of granite behind it that was just really fun, and then big hills kind of all around. So it was this beautiful terrain. It's just a wonderful place to go and hang out. And, you know, and my grandfather was, he'd started going there uh, his first, well, his first summer in South Dakota with my grandmother, which would have been 1932. I kind of think it was 32. It may have been, <laughs> it might have been 33 the first year after my dad was, my dad was born in 33. Mm -hmm. um, but they, basically they were in, my grandfather started at Pine Ridge, then moved to Martin, South mm -hmm. Dakota, in between Pine Ridge and Rosebud. And um, so one of the things, you know, about uh, doing that kind of mission work was he had a church in Martin, he had a bunch of different kinds of chapels at one point, something like 17 or 18 chapels mm. scattered around. So oh. he had lay readers set out in every one, but basically he would try to do two services on Sunday or maybe three. So he'd do one in Martin, he'd get in his car and drive to another one, he'd do another one for the evening, and then for the rest of the week he'd be driving around to these chapels, and then he'd try to like get to one every you know fourth or fifth Sunday. So, I mean, my grandfather worked hard. I mean, it was hard. You know, all this driving and, and just, you know, one person for so much space and so many people. I mean, it was, so the church, you know, um, rightly, nicely, but appropriately, you know, would let him go up there for a couple weeks every summer, you mm -hmm. know. So he started that right at the very beginning of his career. He got to watch Mount Rushmore being built. They'd go to Mount Rushmore every year. It was pretty close to there. You could hike up there, actually, um, from the camp. Um, so then, you know, we all started going, and this was a great moment where my grandfather would hold court, and he would tell stories, tell all these Indian stories, and he'd sing, and, and you know, so that was like this sort of culture infusion that, like, we didn't really get from my dad, mm. but we sort of got from my grandfather. And then every time my grandfather would visit, um, you know, I think... Uh, we would just listen to him and we would tape record him. I've written mm -hmm. a little bit about this, not, mm -hmm. not much, but I think there's, there's a guy at UMass Amherst, I think, who's working on this project about Indians in the recording industry, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I hope he's finding a bunch of stuff. Because my memory of this is every time my grandfather or my great uncle Phil Lane would show up at the house and be like, get out the tape recorder, <laughs> you know? And of course, this is what we do. We'd get out these tape recorders and like we would record them and my grandfather would say, let me tell you all the stories in my repertoire. So he would tell us all his stories. And he had a lot of stories because he had uh, Yankton stories because they were from Yankton. He had Standing Rock stories because he grew up at Standing Rock. He had Pine Ridge stories because he'd been there and he had Rosebud stories because he was around there. So, um, you know, he was a great storyteller. And... Um, but, you know, from time to time, he would forget that he'd already told us all the stories. So we would sit and record these stories, you know, kind of. And once a year, we'd pull out the tape recorder or more, you know, and record stories. And, I mean, it's kind of funny because now, every once in a while, someone will say, you know, I was cleaning out my parents' house, and I found this rare tape of your grandfather telling <laughs> stories, and I'm going to send it to you. And it's such a nice thing, you know, and I really appreciate it. And, 
Um, and I don't want to tell anybody, like, this isn't rare. <laughs> 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 I've got so many tapes of my grandfather, you know, going through his repertoire. At one point, he had like something like 300 stories, though. I mean, wow. like a lot of stories, um, wow. you know. And uh, so, <clears throat> so we would do those kinds of things with him. And, um, and he and Phil Lane would sit together and talk, um, Phil Lane Sr., and they'd all, they'd just talk in Lakota the whole time, and they were both, it was so, so beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. to listen to them. And, but, you know, that was not enough for us to ever acquire any language, you know. Yeah. It's like you pick up 20 words, you mm -hmm. know, and they're all, you know, kind of goofy words, you know. So, um, you know, so that was that was sort of the way it played out. It was like well, you've got my grandfather on, on the one hand, you've got my dad giving us two different contexts. We're thinking about being native. You know, mm -hmm. um, I only later discovered right that there was three three other Indian kids in my high school. Mm -hmm. None of us really ever identified the other. Like we were all in kind of the same sort of boat, right? You know, relocated families or families that had their own kind of reservation ties, but didn't really weren't part of, the, say, the Denver Indian community. Um, you know, that was and that was a little sad, actually. Um, you know, to realize, dang, we kind of missed out on. We could have actually had something a little bit. You know, even in this moment when, yeah. Yeah, understandable. So th what was your experience with school? I mean, I'm asking, and I wouldn't assume that you knew you were going to go into the academy necessarily the way that you have, but just w what subjects did you like? How were you kind of experiencing school and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I was really, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, I started, I started playing the clarinet, and then we took the trip to the orthodontist, you know, who said, okay, here's the deal. <laughs> the clarinet levers your teeth out, right? Your son has a slight overbite. If you had your son play the trombone or the trumpet or something like that, it'll push the teeth back in and you won't need to worry about braces. And my parents said, the clarinet goes back, you choose. Do you want the trombone or the trumpet? And I was like, I don't know. And of course, um, the band director, I was a former band director, the band director will always say, don't need any more trumpets, always need more trombones. And so I ended up playing the trombone, and um, that was when we first lived in Denver. And we went to Washington State. Um, you know, uh, I, I just kind of started taking lessons, because it's sort of a little bit what you did. And um, it turns out my teacher was really good. Hmm. I didn't even know it. Uh, he was hmm. a band director at another school. I'd go over there, Ferndale. I'd go over there and take lessons. I remember getting there, it was dark like 3.30 in the afternoon in the middle of winter, it was dark and cold, and it was awful, I'm like, ah. But what it turns out, I didn't even know it, but I actually got pretty good, you know, for like a sixth grader, seventh grader on the trombone. So we moved back to Colorado. I was like the new kid, we moved mid-year, and you know, um, this is how it works in like middle school and high school bands, right? You have chair auditions and you know blind audition, and the band teacher says, "I'm going to sit behind the piano and play number one." And number one would play, and then I would play. And so I came in as this kind of like just kid, new kid, and they had one of these blind auditions, and it was like, "Oh, actually, I get to be first chair." <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> and the band director's like, "Oh my God, who's the new kid who can kind of play?" You know, and um, so kind of from that moment on. You know, I became really pretty committed to playing trombone. So I got a teacher in Denver, Dick McGee, who now um, directed the Las Vegas Symphony later, and a lot of bands in, in Las Vegas. He's a great teacher and a, just a great guy and a fan, amazing musician. So he was this inspiration. And I had a great high school band program. This guy, Larry Wallace, who was a world-class teacher. I mean, just totally inspirational. Um, strict, hard, funny, uh, he could get this band playing like such high quality music. I mean, such high quality music. So you'd have that kind of like affective, emotional thing happening around music, like on a regular basis. You know, like this is how why music education really matters. I'm gonna be my I mean, music educator hat because mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. walk, walk into this band and I would walk out with this kind of rapturous feeling, mm -hmm. which you don't get, you know, from a crappy middle school band or a crappy high school band. But if you have a really good band that's playing hard, good music, and it's like, and you have a taskmaster who inspires you. So that was my life was kind of about, uh, you know, about playing the trombone. Mm -hmm. And then in junior high <coughs> um, or middle school, uh, I signed up for guitar class, and this was the moment where my dad totally came through. 
right? This is one of those kind of great moments. So I signed up for guitar class. I don't have a guitar. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I go to the first day of guitar class, and everybody's sitting there with their guitars, you know, and they're these little crappy guitars. And, and I'm like, yeah, I don't have a guitar. And, um, you know, and then like halfway through the class, my dad walks through the door, and he's got this, you know, which uh, this harmony guitar, which was like not a great guitar, but was so much better than it. It was like, now that I've got the best guitar in the class, it's this great <laughs> little harmony guitar. And, you know, so, um, uh, and there was like a ninth grader who was like the teaching assistant who could play Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> so it was a total, <laughs> it's exactly the stereotypical guitar story, this guy Jim Sherman. So he taught me to play Stairway to Heaven and like, and, and so, <laughs> You know, so I, I really got into the guitar, and my dad was so happy to see me into the guitar because he didn't really care that much about the trombone, but he loved country music, and he would always say, you know, play Wildwood Flower, play this, play that, you know. And so um, he would kind of get me learning, like, old country stuff. Um, and I didn't, hadn't started singing yet. I couldn't really sing. But I would, you know, play this kind of Carter style picking thing and I pick out a melody for him. I'm, Can you hear that's Wildwood Flower, you know? <laughs> He'd get very, you know, happy um, for a moment or two. And, uh, you know, so then I, I started getting pretty serious about the, about the guitar too. Um, my first year of college, I basically locked, even as I was a music major practicing trombone, I also kind of locked myself in my room and just practiced guitar all the time. And, um, you know, so, and started trying to sing and, you know, started playing in some little bands and, you know, stuff like that. And my dad was so supportive of this. So he'd be like, you need an electric guitar. <laughs> like, yeah, I do. <laughs> you bet I do. So we'd go down. There was this place called Ferretta Music Store. David Ferretta, who was kind of the sort of king of the folk, you know, kind of scene in Denver, um, uh, had this guitar store. So I remember going down there and we picked out this guitar, this ovation black ovation semi-solid guitar and um uh <clears throat> and he's like yeah you need an amp for this you know you now you need an amp and i remember this guy harry fleischman who had, was working in the basement he was a tech uh, later on and invented this super cool bass of which uh, i bought one um hmm. uh he's like well let me let's go to the, all the pawn shops up and down broadway and let's look for a good amp for you and so i remember this great afternoon with me and my dad and harry fleischman going around all these, you know, skanky pawn shops looking for guitar amps, and we got this little Sears Silvertone amp from the late <laughs> 50s. It was just so cool. I still have it. Uh, it's a cranky old tube amp, and, uh, you know, so this, it turns out, in retrospect, was not a great electric rig, but, um, <laughs> but it was really fun at the moment, you know. Um, and then somewhere in there, um, I played with some great musicians in, in high school, this guy Frank O'Corran, who's basically carved out an entire life playing music. Like, he's a mm. successful music guy. He does jingles, and he writes, and he, he's a banjo rep for Deering. And so we played bluegrass. I started playing bluegrass with him. Um, played in a jazz, we had a jazz band, um, you know, where I tried to play guitar, not very successfully. Um, Frank and I took music theory classes through, like, the Never Open School, you know. So it's like, so music was this huge, huge, part of my life and in a lot of ways it was the sort of um, the Oedipal escape valve from my dad mm. you know so I did a lot of music um, and then I mean the other thing I then then I had a really good circle of friends too so you know um, I'd also I'd grown up playing um, baseball mostly um, a little bit of football so I I played baseball for one year in high school and then I got mono mm. and <laughs> <coughs> really pretty much just had to stop you know and then I never never quite went back to that but I had a really great circle of friends we played basketball so there's this guy his name is Alan Leake he was a kind of like junior caretaker at his church so he had keys to his church and this church had done this really interesting thing where they built a new sanctuary and they turned the old sanctuary into this basketball court mm -hmm. and so this was like all the people who I played basketball in junior high um, you know, but like definitely not ever good enough to play anything. But so it was a whole bunch of people like that, right? People who would like nerdy guys who really liked to play. And so we played basketball all the time down in this, this old church sanctuary thing, which is super fun. And we'd run little softball games and baseball games kind of on the side. And um, a bunch of us worked on the school yearbook. Like we were just mm -hmm. total high school nerds, you know, just, you know, we were on the student council and, you know, all that 
all that kind of stuff. So I had this really good, rich high school life based around music and around a really good circle of friends. Um, you know, working on, I was a yearbook editor, you know, working on that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of people remember high school as a bad time. And, you know, of course, there's all this weird emotional stuff that goes on. Uh, fine. Sure. But, like, yeah. I remember it as being great, actually. <laughs> really great. <laughs> yeah. And so I have a, a couple related questions, but I just thought I'd ask, could you tell me more about your mom and her role in your life? Cause yeah. I, I guess your dad's traveling a lot. I mean, he's becoming a sort of celebrity and also, um, well, from what you said about your grandfather, I guess there's kind of a theme of really hard working in your family. Like, what was your mom doing to hold all these things together and yeah. be there in your life? <clears throat> um, as hard as my dad was working, my mom always worked harder. <laughs> you know? I mean, so it's very easy to kind of get, get sucked into a narrative about my dad. So my mom's family... You know, Swiss and Swedish, mm -hmm. so they migrated um, to Bishop Hill, um, Illinois, which was a great place for Swedish immigrants to land in the 19th century. And then mm -hmm. they ended up in Davenport, um, you know, where they kind of worked into a kind of middle class, uh, you know, sort of existence. Her father was a, you know, kind of manufacturer's rep, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of guy, just a basic business person. Um, uh, and my mom... Um, Met my dad in Iowa State. Uh, she was a tri delt. He mm -hmm. was a you know ex marine uh, who played <laughs> pinochle in the student union all the time. I mean, it was it, I, how they got together. I don't really know. At one point, though, my mom said, "Well, your father was just out of the Marines, and he was really built and good looking and funny and smart, and you gotta you know kind of." And, and, so I think, you know, my parents, they just did have this kind of, they, they kind of gravitated to each other in this interesting kind of um, way. And, um, you know, I mean, they had, they had, I mean, like all couples, right, they had some hard times together. But um, the moving around, I think, was a little bit hard on my mom. Uh, I think the 60s in general were kind of hard on my mom. Um, but she, you know, um, she was the one who did kind of all of that sort of kid maintenance stuff, which meant mm -hmm. not just like, oh, going to school and running the Cub Scout troop and that kind of stuff, but like my mom like taught me to play basketball, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, so my mom would out there, and she didn't know how to play basketball, right? But it's like my mom would go out there, and she would like stand under the hoop and get the ball and feed me, and I would shoot. And so, I mean, so this, so like I could always rely on my mom to play basketball with me. And just same with like my grandmother, her mother, mm -hmm you know, would go out and play catch, you know? I'd be like, here, Grandma, here's a glove. Now, she couldn't really throw or catch, but she would try. <laughs> and I was, you know, I couldn't really throw. I was a little kid. I couldn't throw that well either. So my mom, like, at one point, like, completely, like, tore up her ankle, broke her ankle mm. playing basketball with me. I mean, so that's, oh, wow. you know, that's a, that's a fact about my mom that sort of is worth, you know, knowing. And then in the, the early 70s, after we came back from Bellingham, my mom went back to school, did a degree in library science at DU, mm -hmm. at Denver, University of Denver. <clears throat> um, her mother had been a librarian, was the children's room librarian in Davenport Library. Um, so my mom, you know, uh, did, went back to school, and so she was commuting down to Denver. She'd get us up in the morning. You know, we were in Golden, Colorado at the time. Um, she'd get us up in the morning. She'd get us all going. You know, my dad's sound asleep. <clears throat> Then, you know, she would either, like, race off in her car down to DU, or sometimes she'd drop us off, you know, at school, and she'd race back, and, you know, and at the same time, then she started doing a lot of research for my dad. So mm -hmm. some of the un unacknowledged labor of my dad's work is my mom's labor. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, for example, uh, in, I don't know, 2002 or three something like that, like that, my dad and Ray DeMalley published this book of, you know, treaties and agreements. It's a two-volume thing. It's basically like, so you've got the Kapler, Charles Kapler volume of all the ratified treaties, and this is all the unratified and the kind of weird stuff, and like, and that project was my mom's master's thesis project. That's how it started. So she did some huge chunk of the labor for that, for a book that shows up as Ray's and my dad's and you know they acknowledge her in the acknowledgments but the fact is you know that was that was really the germ of that project and it's clear you know she wasn't didn't go into it thinking I want to do a treaty project she was doing work for him you know she was converting her master's project into work for him but so she did a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff and especially the 
as time went on. So there's another book of you know his, which is her editing, mm -hmm. selecting essays, right, um, of his stuff. So she was you know um, uh, always a, an intellectual part of his world that he did not acknowledge, right, appropriately, and she was not happy about it. And you know, so and we all knew that, and we all kind of felt that, right? I mean, so there was a problem about labor and acknowledgement and credit, I think, in that world that was, and why he didn't do that, I don't know. You know, it doesn't seem, it never seemed right to anybody. So, you know, so there was that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, my mom, you know, she's still alive, she's 81, she lives in Tucson. Um, she's a, a resilient, you know, she just had her knee done a couple of years ago, but she's out walking, and you know, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, my mom really did kind of hold the family together. It, it sounds that way. Um, it, and so, as far as you ending up in college, did you always know you were going to college? Did you, like, how did you, what's the pathway there? What happened? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, you know, I, yeah, you kind of, I always thought I was going to college. I just assumed I was going to go to college. But I never thought more about it than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when I was a senior, uh, I was in the Allstate Orchestra. Mm. And so here we are, like the four best trombone players in the state of Colorado, you know. And, um, and it was super fun. It was great. And it was up in Boulder. And I was like, oh, Boulder, it's pretty nice. Um, you know, so... Um, but my applications would be, I applied to three places, you know, I applied to Colorado, Colorado State, because, I don't know, that's just kind of what you do. And I remembered how much I had liked Bellingham, and so I applied to the University of Puget Sound, knowing nothing about it at all. I didn't know anything about it. And, you know, unlike today's college applications, mine were like written by hand with a stubby pencil without an eraser, you know, <laughs> on a piece of paper. And I asked my mom for a check for $20, and I just sent in the applications, and I didn't really think anything more about it. Um, and then kind of midway through my senior year, right around the time of this Allstate Orchestra thing, um, you know, Colorado called and said, you know, I mean, you should also send an audition tape if you're thinking about majoring in music. And so I did this audition tape, and then I got this little scholarship, because it, not because I was good, it turns out. This was the revelation of my college years. <laughs> it's like, I was not good. Um, uh, but because they graduated all their trombone players the year before, they had like this whole crop of seniors and now they had nobody and so they actually just needed to staff orchestras and bands and so they reallocated money to help trombone players. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so um, I hadn't thought about a major, I hadn't thought about any of that stuff, but I just became a music major. Um, so, <laughs> and I was a music performance major because I thought, oh, you know, I'm one of the four best trombone players in the state of Colorado this year. I must be, oh, I must be pretty good. Um, so I got there and, um, you know, and I was fine, right? I mean, I got to play in the symphony um, the very, my very first semester and we were playing, we played Petrushka and the Firebird. We did two Stravinsky things. We did Brahms third. Oh my God, which I, I, my, still my favorite piece of music ever. Um, we did, uh, yeah, what, John Giovanni the, in the opera side, you know, section. Um, you know, so it was, it was great. Mm -hmm. And it was super fun, and I loved it. I really loved it. But, you know, what I, uh, about halfway through my sophomore year, and I practiced really hard, you know, and I got a lot better, a lot faster. And about halfway through my sophomore year, I just kind of plateaued. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't get any better, you know. <laughs> it was like, and I kept working really hard, and I kept working really hard. And I just wasn't really going anywhere. And my friends were actually were getting better. And then some grad students came in, and they were really good. And I kind of just like looked in the mirror one day and thought, you know, there is such a thing as talent. And I have a modest amount of it, but not enough to actually build a life around being a music performance major. Mm -hmm. So I switched to music education, as many, many of my colleagues did. Um, and. Uh, which was definitely a kind of a sad thing in some ways, because there's a mm -hmm. dumbing down. I'm just, to be frank, yeah. when you move to an education program, it's like, really? This is what we're studying? You know, I don't know, it just didn't. But in some ways I became a better musician because you have to learn all these other instruments, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I worked hard to learn other instruments and, and that was fun. Um, I became a music ed major. Um, interestingly, uh, 
I mean, two other things that were, I think, useful about this. One is mm -hmm. I actually took some history classes and I started to kind of imagine. I loved music history, even though I was a completely obnoxious student. I actually wrote a letter in 2015 to Oliver Ellsworth, who had been my music, one of my two music history teachers, and I kind of apologized for being such an asshole in class. You know, I was the kid who sat in the back and was sort of snarky and like not really. I know it's hard for you to believe that, seeing what a nice person <laughs> I am, right? But, um, you know, uh, and I think he kind of remembered me a little bit as being a not very pleasant student. I don't know. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't mean. I was just, you know, I don't know. Um, in any case, I did start to have a kind of historical consciousness mm -hmm. about music, and I wanted to think in big kind of global terms. I was really interested in sort of thinking like, okay, when Bach is doing this stuff over here, like what's happening in North America over here? Oh, it turns out like European colonialism is what's happening here, you know, and what's happening, you know, kind of elsewhere. So I started to kind of just have the, just the glimmerings of a kind of historical and global kind of consciousness that came out of music history. So that's one thing that was, I think, useful. And I now look back and think it was an important moment, you know, mm -hmm. in my life. Um, second thing is I kept playing guitar and I started playing um, bluegrass with this guy, Ben Bowen, and we put together a band that was um, actually a pretty good band um, mm -hmm. uh, and played, you know, played around a bit, played out a bit. Um, uh, and it was, you know, it was just really fun. And it's when I, I kind, of, kind of started trying to sing more seriously because, like, the world is full of guitar players who won't sing. Mm -hmm. It's nutty. So I don't sing well, you know, but, um, uh, but I started doing that. And then a few years later, I ended up playing with this guy, Ed Fenner, who was, like, my sort of, uh, you know, separated at birth kind of deal, right? I mean, we just had this kind of intuitive sense of playing with one another, and it was really you know, fun to play with him. Ed had other kinds of issues and problems, and we played, played in a couple of bands. And, um, you know, so I started doing this kind of band thing on the side, mm -hmm. which gradually over time shifted from a kind of bluegrassy, folky thing into a kind of 50s country thing into eventually a kind of 80s new wave thing where we wore like stupid clothes with zippers on them and <laughs> shit like that. I mean, it was really... <laughs> and then eventually I also had the same kind of revelation there, mm. you know. So Ed and I, at one point, um, I actually left middle school teaching because we were all in this band and we said, let's just do it, let's be a band, let's all quit our jobs. And everybody else was working at like Subway and stuff. And I was working the Cherry Creek Public Schools in a really nice school and a really nice job. And, you know, um, uh, so, you know, but somewhere in there in kind of around 1984, 85 or so, I had the same parallel revolution, revelation about, you know, my guitar Mm. vocal songwriting kinds of skills that like just you know do it for fun it'll take right I mean there is such a thing as talent and I have a limited amount of it you know so I've come to terms with that but I still you know music has always been this kind of dream thing that's always sitting around in the back of my head and it definitely shapes the way I think and and feel mm. about stuff and so being at Colorado being a music major graduating from music education all that stuff was all kind of kicking around, you know, kicking around in there. Um, and then I did, I managed to get this great job at Cherry Creek West Middle School, hmm. um, right out of, you know, right out of school. And uh, I replaced a guy who had been there 35 years, um, you know, and I looked really young. And so it was a, it was a weird, I did it for two years, um, hmm. you know, and then I kind of realized, on the one hand, there was this band thing, but on the other hand, I realized, Man, this guy before me, Rico Romano. Rico Romano is like <laughs> perfect Italian band director of the old school, you know. Um, my first year, I really wasn't that good at it, you know. Mm -hmm. I probably got like 60% of it kind of right. But by the second year, I mean, it's kind of not that hard, really. Mm -hmm. You know, if you really put your mind to mastering the techniques and the skills of like running a middle school band program. I was probably getting like 90% of it right, and I could tell in year three I was going to get 95%, and then that was going to, and I would never get to 100% right, and everything was going to be sort of variations on trying to fix a small degree of failure, but for the most part it was probably going to be fine, and I could imagine just like Rico Romano, 35 years of doing that, and the fact that I had this, was playing in this band, and I sort of was just starting to think about other stuff, and of course I had, you know, there's my dad kind of lingering around over you know, my shoulder, and uh, he was teaching at the University of Arizona at that time, and 
I remember one year going down there for the holidays and, you know, him saying, well, you know, I'm doing this one grad seminar next semester and I think I'm just going to have them meet out at the house. And I was like, okay, I drive from Boulder to Cherry Creek in order to have a seven o'clock stage band rehearsal. <laughs> and then I have four bands and seven sections of general music and you're having one grad seminar that meets at your house? <laughs> like, I've obviously chosen wrong, you know? So I sort of did have this, my dad was kind of lingering around in there, these sort of musical aspirations were lingering around in there, the sense that like I might have a different kind of future that was not so preordained, was all kind of hanging around there. So it became sort of easy for me to, to leave, you know? And then I had this lost year that was a great year. I played in the band, hmm. two bands. Um, I, three bands by the time all was said and done, actually. Um, I coached basketball, coached middle school basketball, and I just substitute taught. It was also the year that I got married to my father-in-law. Super not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a loser have you married? <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> Did these bands tour at all, or were you playing mostly kind of locally? Or? Yeah, I mean, it was mostly locally. It was, um, uh, so this first band, was this band that basically was trying to do like 80s top 40 stuff, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like a basic bar band. And, um, you know, so we had this woman who played synthesizer, not super well. I played bass. I switched over to bass. I mean, I had, <clears throat> this is the other part of my musical life, right, is like way too many times I've been sitting in a room with three guitar players and the two good, good guitar players look at me and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, if that guy played, he's not that bad. If that guy played bass, well, all we need is a drummer and we have a band, right? And so there was a moment where I embraced my destiny to be a bass player, which is like, I'm not that great a bass player. I'm a, like many good converted guitar players, you still have the sense of the guitar even as you're playing the bass, mm -hmm. you know? So um, it's something to do with beat and timing and you have to work really hard to actually be a bass player. But I was a bass player in that band. Um, and then we had this great drummer who had a Simmons drum set and like funky, funky hair, purple streak. And this is like 82, 83. I mean, everybody has purple in their hair now, but you know. Um. <laughs> so we would, you know, we had this agent who was, who was like um, from Texas, Randy. Uh, he was like, all right, here's the deal. You, you got to hold together as a band for nine months before I'll book you anywhere good. So he would send us out to different places, you know, out on the plains. Like, I'm going to send you to Glen Rock, Wyoming this weekend. I'm like, oh, great. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I give you his accent because we had this one moment where he's like, I booked you guys into the X Club in Fort Morgan. We're like, the X Club? That sounds like us, right? <laughs> and we get out there, and of course, the X Club is the Elks Club. <laughs> and we're playing our we're playing our set and at 11 o'clock you know at the Elks Club they turn off the lights and they have this clock and the elk lights up and they, they give this speech and they have a special microphone <laughs> that like distorts <laughs> it is now the tender hour of 11 o'clock where the beating pulsing throbbing heart of elkdom across the world beats as one and you know you just you can't not and there's a big elk behind you on the stage by the way you know and you cannot not laugh right I mean and of course they're completely offended and you know, so this is this was my life, right? This kind of stuff. I mean, that job in Glenrock, we got there and we were a little bit late getting in there, and uh, the whole place is full of like really kind of scary rednecks, and it's a big place, and um, and they start yelling at us as we're setting up. They're like, 104, 104, and we're like, is that the radio station, or I don't know what that is, and so we you know kind of play our our new wavy set, <laughs> and, you know, it's like, and here's a, here's a Cars tune, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, and it's clearly not going anywhere. And so during our first break, they put this song on the jukebox, and it turns out that's what they were calling for, is 104, which is a song called You Piss Me Off, You Fucking Jerk. And I don't know if you know this song, right, but it's a, you know, three chord song, and so they play it like three times, and we're like, okay, we get it, you know. So we go back and we play that song like three or four times. You know, and they love it. They just want to hear the same song over and over again, you know. <laughs> just, well, it's 40 below, but I don't give a fuck. Got a heater in my truck, and I'm off to the rodeo. You piss me off. You fucking jerk. You get on my nerves. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I don't know. We played a place in Craig, Colorado that had chicken wire over the bar. Um, mm -hmm. You're over the stage. <laughs> we saw a guy get thrown through a window. I mean, it was like, it's deeply unfun, actually. <laughs> So, and mm. Randy was totally right. Like, we couldn't hold it together for nine months, mm. you know. And we ended up, <clears throat> the band breaking up one snowy night, you know, sort of standing out in front of the house, yelling at each other, like throwing gear at each other, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Take your phase shifter pedal, you know. <laughs> like, this kind of awful, <laughs> you know, awful kind of moment, you know. So, all the gear ends up getting split up, you know. I'm stuck with this van, <laughs> this big green van that's, you know, <laughs> gets three miles to the gallon and is a wreck and I don't know. And a few gigs that, you know, I had kind of booked. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so I ended up, um, one of these gigs was a wedding for a friend and um, I had met, my next door neighbor was this guy named Dave Conley who was a PhD student in the ed school, ed, mm -hmm. ed D student, um, who now teaches at University of Oregon. And at one point, he had this other grad student over for dinner, this guy, Bob McCann, and he came over and he got us. He's like, this guy, Bob McCann, and his wife, Nancy McCann, they play music, and you play music, and so, like, you guys should know each other. And we're like, hey, yeah, great, what do you play? And, you know, so we kind of, like, just sort of chatted about things. So I realized, like, oh, I've got at least one of these gigs that i got to do. So I call Bob McCann, and I'm like, would you guys just, you know, kind of, work with me and we'll just play a wedding set and you know would that be okay and of course these guys it turns out are in a wedding band <laughs> <laughs> so my fall is now complete right from symphonic trombone playing to like music education and from like aspirations for band to like wedding reception <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it turns out that Bob and Nancy um, have become like they're they're still some of my oldest and dearest friends and the lead guitar player in the band this guy Marty Peters Super smart. Hmm. So Bob's doing his ed D. Nancy's doing a nursing certificate. Marty's doing a master's degree in Russian history. Um, so they're all really s smart people, and so and it was and they were great musicians. Hmm. And this is how you do a wedding re reception band. It's like you never practice, right? Because you always have to be working. You can't really afford to take too much time out for practicing. So, so these guys came, and we basically played this wedding cold, um, with me jumping into their set and then backing me up on tunes and. Um, and we kind of, at the end of the night, we're kind of like, you know, that was pretty fun. And they were like, we're kind of tired of being a trio. It's really, so then I started playing keyboards in this band, you know, <laughs> and I'm really not a keyboard player at all, you know, but it's like you throw, you know, I mean, at that point, if you had a, you know, a decent synthesizer, right, you could throw in so much kind of richness and color just by being a guy who could play a few chords, right, and a riff here and there, you know. So, you know, you'd learn like, uh, uh, a riff for like, like uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a song, like, the heat is on, you know? Mm -hmm. So here I am like, and that is what, that's like straining my abilities, <laughs> kind of right there. <laughs> so, but you know, so in that band, I switched off between bass and guitar and, um, and keyboards, and we played for a couple of years, you know, oh. together, and it was great. It was so much better than doing bar band stuff. Mm -hmm. So. You get paid, uh, you usually get to eat, you get cake at the end of the night, you know, and then you just go home instead of like, you know, three nights in Glen Rock, Wyoming, you know. So, yeah, so my fall was, my fall was complete um, then. I also, though, started playing with this um, woman named Linda Meitch, hmm. uh, and this was like the more kind of, um, I mean, the wedding reception band was just fun. We had pranked each other all the time. We did all kinds of crazy stuff. It was just really good. Um, Linda Meitch was this really super creative kind of deal. She's a super good songwriter, beautiful singer, hmm. and, but she had this kind of minimalist kind of thing. So she would play guitar well, and then she had me playing fretless electric bass. Hmm. This was the bass I bought from Harry Fleischman who had designed this thing that was just like a neck, you know, <laughs> a neck and a little frame, and that was it. And it looked super cool. and didn't quite have enough guts to actually support it as a neck, it turns out, you know, because it warped really easily. Um, but it was beautiful and cool, and it sounded great. And so I played this fretless electric bass with her, and I worked hard to actually kind of get that down. And then we had a koto player. It's a Japanese instrument. And so if you imagine, like, delicate guitar, ding, 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 boom, boom, bass kind of thing, and then boing, boing, king, kind of stuff. Um, 
minimal sound, right? Mm -hmm. So it was this really interesting thing. And we played a lot of these kind of, you know, funky, punky, pop-up kind of gigs in weird places. Like we played this place called the Denver Turnverein, which used to be like a German gymnasium. But we got there, the whole place is just surrounded. It's sort of like a wreck surrounded by barbed wire and fences. And we're like, mm -hmm. like, it's in there? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All the hip, cool people in Denver are making their way through the hole in the fence. <laughs> They're going into the <laughs> ruined building. We're like, okay, great. And we get in there, and Ann Waldman, the beat poet, is there. And she's like, got this 20 foot long scarf, and she's waving around her neck, going, it is, 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 it is. And we're like, damn, okay, this is a scene. This is totally great. So then we come in and we play our minimalist punk folk kind of music, and people loved it. You know, they really liked her. She was really great. Um, and then she got this idea she had to write songs in French and that to do that she had to learn French and she had to learn French in Paris and so she took off. <laughs> she went to Paris <laughs> and then came back and recorded a really nice jazz album actually, mm. which you can get on iTunes, not that I'm advertising, but um, yeah, so I had this kind of nice, I did have a kind of nice musical glide path, you know, <laughs> kind of out of my aspirations, you know, into other stuff. and. Um, I don't know. Sorry, that's a big long digression, but I guess that's what oral history is about, it, right? It is. No, that was yeah. great. Yeah. Um, well, and so just to backtrack a little, and so you met your wife. Can I, whatever you would want to share about that, like, or the woman who became your wife, I guess. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so we met in high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we both went to Wheat Ridge High School. Um, you know, together. She was a year behind me. Uh, she was um, kind of like a high school nerd like me. She was on the yearbook staff. She was on student council. Um, I crossed paths with her in that way. And she was also just her friend group and my friend group sort of like sometimes kind of overlapped. And so mm -hmm. like, <clears throat> uh, you know, I think like junior year prom, we all kind of went to in the same kind of group and I was with someone else and she was with someone else and then, you know, and then it was like the end of the summer of my senior year, um, you know, we were at the Wheat Ridge Carnation Festival. And, uh, you know, so Wheat Ridge used to be a carnation town. This was mm -hmm. greenhouses everywhere. Every kid in Wheat Ridge, you know, except me, I didn't do it, um, had spent time like doing carnation warehouse, you know, carnation work. Like, uh, you'd look in the want ads, back when we had want ads in the jobs, and like all this whole thing, like wanted car workhouse work, or, you know, greenhouse worker. Carnation, you know, and you'd go and you'd water carnations and things. So the carnation festivals is like this big deal. So it's the end of summer, and it had, you know, you know, it, it has that Springsteen feel to it, right? A night mm -hmm. like that, you know. <laughs> so, um, so I was just roaming around with my friend Paul Chan, and um, uh, and we ran into her. My wife's name is Peggy, Peggy Burns, and I ran into her and some of her friends. And we were talking about stuff, and she. I had known her from this, this thing called Young Life, you know, which is kind of a Christian youth high school deal. And I wasn't really into Young Life that much myself. Um, uh, but they always needed guitar players. <laughs> so I would go to Young Life and play the guitar and, you know, these songs and, and things like that. So I'd known her from Young Life and from Yearbook and these other things. And so we were talking and she said, you know, I really want to try out this church. I want to go to this Catholic church up in Evergreen, you know, tomorrow morning. I really want to go. And um, and none of her friend, their friends were like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go to church with you. And I'm like, hey, I was like, and I just looked at her. and I kind of got this feeling like, oh yeah, you know, she's actually really pretty and kind of cool. And I'm like, I'll go to, I'll make you a deal. Like, I'll go to church with you tomorrow if you go to the Rocky Mountain Bluegrass Festival with me tomorrow afternoon, and we'll just make a day of it. And she's like, yeah, okay, why not? So we went to church, the same church we later got married in, and then we went to the Bluegrass Festival and we saw Bill Monroe and, you know, and it was, it was great. I'm like, this is Bill Monroe. <laughs> and she's like, oh, that sounds really good. I like Bill Monroe. So we had this really, really nice afternoon and then, uh, and we sort of never looked back, you know? It's like, so that was 1977. Yeah, so 40 years. Actually, I just went to my 40th year reunion, you know, this year. Peg came, came with, because of course she knew a whole bunch of people in my year, same high school. And uh, yeah, so then she went to the University of San Diego for a year, um, came back to the University of Colorado. It was a little hard for us to readjust to kind of being in the same place. You know, we got used to kind of being apart, you know, um, romanticizing our distance in some ways. Like, oh, now we got to be in the same place. And then, but 
you know, a few of those little early hitches that any couple might have, but I don't know. We, uh, she was a teacher, also a public school teacher, so she taught in the Adams County School District, mm -hmm. which was a little bit more of a gritty kind of school district. Teaching was harder there than it was for me in Cherry Creek. Um, we got married, like after my, after my two years of teaching, that year when I, my last year we got married in that year, she taught for one more year. And then <clears throat> one of her good friends was working for Xerox and Xerox was hiring teachers because mm -hmm. they were so used to standing in front of groups of people and they were, and so my wife went to work for Xerox, Peg went to work for Xerox and she kind of never looked back. I mean, she was really, really good at selling copiers. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so her first territory was Boulder. And so she was like this kind of Boulder hippie chick, Grateful Dead loving, you know, kind of Boulder gal who would load a little copier on a dolly and put, you know, a six pack of beer underneath it and have a little curtain and wheel it down to Pearl Street Mall. And like, hey, do you want to buy a copier? I mean, like, so she, <laughs> this is kind of like her personality. Wow. Um, so she was just really, really good at selling copiers um, and uh, you know after my after my kind of lost year um, my dad kind of pulled me aside and he said look if you're just gonna mess around with things you should go get another degree mm -hmm. so the whole time I was playing with the wedding reception band I did a master's degree in pro broadcast journalism um, in part because and it's why it's so cool to see these cameras here um, during that lost year one of the things I did was I started crewing on music video shoots in Denver. Mm -hmm. And so what had happened, it was interesting, right? The cable company had negotiated this kind of monopolistic sort of deal, which required them to make a whole bunch of public access stuff available to anybody who wanted to use it, including like a big production truck that you could actually check out and lots of gear and cameras and things like that. So this guy, Mike Drum, super smart, kind of set up this little business using the public access stuff to produce videos, music videos, for kind of LA bands who basically wanted to shoot a demo video, like not the real thing, but pretty good, good mm -hmm. quality. And uh, <clears throat> so I had a friend who um, worked with Mike Drum. Actually, she'd been the vocal music teacher at my middle school, <laughs> and she left, she left too. Judy Cheatham, she made documentaries for a while. Um, so, uh, I should use all these names, right? Because like, you know, okay. people can track this. Someone wants to like actually track the history of like, you know, vernacular <laughs> video production in 1984 in Denver, Colorado. You can look for Mike Drum. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, so we'd shoot these videos. It was super mm -hmm. fun. It was really great. And I did, you know, just go for work. You know, I'd make mm -hmm. smoke out of coffee grounds and I carried cable for a camera guy named Jim Furrer who was a really, really good camera guy. It was super fun to watch him, you know, because these were big, heavy cameras, you know, like back in the day. And he was doing all these kind of, like, now I'm going to get the underneath shot of the guitar, you know, and the strings and the fingers, and now I'm going to do a continuous shot and pull out and make it an overhead. And so he was super strong, super good, smooth camera guy, you know, before people used steady cams and, and stuff like that, right? I mean, it's primal, primal video making. Um, so I really kind of was, I was loving this. It was super fun, you know, and I started doing some audio stuff and, uh, you know, I do boom mics for um, mixed martial arts fights and things like that. It's like <laughs> crazy, crazy, <laughs> weird things. So my dad's like, okay, look, you're just messing around with your life. You should get some initials after your name. So go do a master's degree. So I did this master's degree in broadcast journalism at, at CU. Um, and Peg was working at Xerox the whole time. So we had this kind of nice sort of synergy where, you know, she was supporting me, <laughs> basically. <laughs> uh, and of course, there's nothing better than to be an academic and have someone who has access to copiers, typewriters, mm -hmm. and paper. And so, you mm -hmm. know, it was also great, you know, great in those ways. And so I was working, I worked as a night video editor. Um, and this was back in the day when you'd shoot on three quarter and edit to one inch tape. And, you know, the first kind of digital time code editors, you know, I mean, maybe not the first, but like, this was a big deal for this editing place that I was, you know, where we had these. So I'd make car commercials and industrials and things like that. I'd work, you know, from eight until two or three in the morning, you know, just making making stuff and um, and going to school and and you know and Peg was working at Xerox and I was playing in the wedding band, and uh, so I did for my my professional project. I did this video documentary about Sioux land claims in the back. Black Hills. Mm. And so the whole point of all this rambling around is to say mm. that was the moment when I kind of came all the way back around and re-engaged thinking about native stuff. 
And to do that professional project, I had to lay out uh, some um, coursework that was going to support it. And one of those courses was History of the U.S. West, taught by Patty Nelson Limerick, who mm -hmm. had just written this book called Legacy of Conquest, which sort of founded the new Western history. And she was basically teaching her book as I was taking that class. And, um, and I, you know, I was, I mean, I have this little, I do have this, these little trickster impulses, you know, sometimes. So I wrote, we had to, she had us write a personal experience paper. We were reading Western autobiographies, so we had to write a personal experience paper. So I wrote two. So I wrote a real one, and then I wrote one that was also real, but like under a false name that was just full of puns and jokes and satire and making fun of the class <laughs> and, and everything. <laughs> and, you know, Patty being Patty, like, she liked my first paper just fine. She loved my other paper. And I used an, uh, an alienist, uh, alien, alias, Max Chaboyan, who had been a quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Um, I also sometimes used Hank Gomez as an alias, who was a, apparently a real person who my friend Dan Schisler had lost a girlfriend to in Wyoming at one point. And we always said, yeah, you got Hank Gomez again. Yeah, I did. So I had these aliases that I kind of carried around. And um, by the end of the semester, Patty had discovered who I was. She spent the whole semester trying to figure out you know, who I was. And so she said, well, let's go to lunch. So we went to lunch, and she's like, well, so I see you're over in the journalism school, and you should do a PhD. You should do a PhD here at Colorado. We're really trying to build our program in Western history. You'd be a perfect candidate um, you know, for this. And, and so that, that was the first time I really thought about graduate school. Um, I was like, huh, that's a thought. So at the same time, I had also applied to, a, to the Fulbrights, to do a Fulbright in Australia, to go because I was really getting interested in the conceptual questions about sacred space and how yeah. indigenous people imagine sacred space. The Black Hills Project, which started as kind of political, had taken me into this kind of geographic epistemological thing, and I didn't even have a vocabulary to say that at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I would not say I was well educated, really. I mean, I was a music guy, right? I had hardly had to take any other classes. So like, I could play the flute, but I knew nothing about history. <laughs> so I had taken two history, the, you know, Western Civ classes from people who would later be my colleagues at Colorado, Stephen Fisher Galati and um, David Gross, actually. Um, so, but I didn't really know much. I didn't really have much of vocabulary. And the journalism school gave me some theoretical stuff, um, but not, um, not that much and not, not enough. So I applied to, to the Fulbright program. I was a finalist out of the US. Mm. So, and, and there was, I think, five slots in Australia or something. There were seven of us that were finalists. I'm like, yeah, this looks like this is gonna happen. And I had no idea what it would be like to make a film in Australia, you know, um, or to engage uh, Aboriginal people, or to think about the reserve system, or anything like that. I was totally and completely naive and underprepared, and so it's a super good thing that I didn't get it, and I think the Australians actually knew that. So, um, but between the Fulbright thing and Patty saying you should go to grad school, I kind of thought, well, maybe I should just do this. Because I don't really want to be a night editor, and I'm not really seeing a path forward as a video documentary maker, right? Let's see. Let's pick really, really marginal careers that are super hard and incredibly competitive. Symphonic trombone playing, right? <laughs> of which there's like one job a year in the world, right? Oh, rock and roll, right? Uh, oh, documentary production, right? I mean, like, my choices were all bad, right? Um, but uh, so I thought, well, maybe the grad school way is the way to go. So I applied to Indiana, which had an ethnographic filmmaking program, mm -hmm. and Ray DeMalley, who was a family friend and a really good, the best an Plains anthropologist, perhaps of all time, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly of his generation. And I applied to Yale in American Studies. And I got in, uh, amazingly. Yeah, it was so weird. I did, when I was doing the GREs, I um, was partly while I was still, I did those when I was student teaching, um, or when I was substitute teaching. So a lot of times I would go in and the, I was subbing for band and choral teachers, you know, and they'd say, don't you dare work, touch my band, right? I don't trust anybody with my band. So, you, so it's a study hall day for them. So I would go in and I'd say, okay, here's the deal. Uh, we can have study hall today and not really practice if two or three of you who are really good at math will come up here and work with me on some problems that I've got. And this was me studying for the GRE with these super smart high school math kids, right? And so this was my way of studying to get my math scores, you know, kind of up. And uh, so I, Amer I, I did okay on the GRE, I guess. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I, you know, Howard Lamar was at Yale. 
he knew my uncle, he knew my dad. I got to think that there was, you know, some kind of family thing happening mm -hmm. there, you know. But I got in, and Peg and I visited both places, and then, uh, and then we went to, yeah, we went to New Haven. And so this loops us back around to her. Mm -hmm. So when she got to New Haven, she transferred with Xerox. And, um, uh, but what that meant was this was right when the savings and loans collapsed, mm -hmm. and they gave her savings and loans. That was it. Like, so her territory was completely barren, right? There was nothing to be done there. And, you know, her hippie style in Boulder so did not translate, you know, to New Haven, Connecticut, where everything was about ethnic politics and race. Mm -hmm. And this is the big wake up for us, right? Sitting around in Boulder and in Denver, you know, where race was, you know, kind of out there, but not so much. And all of a sudden we show up in New Haven where you know, you've got, um, you've got a kind of ethnic succession, white ethnic succession that involves the Irish and the Italians sort of like jostling each other for power and the Italians eventually displacing the Irish, the original Irish. Um, and then you've got uh, African Americans kind of coming in and seizing political power from the Italians. And then you were just at the moment when Puerto Ricans were sort of showing up as kind of political forces. And so there's this kind of ethnic and race politics of white people hating black people, but white people hating other white people, right? And, and people of color kind of also like looking askance and nervously at one another. So it was, it was a great place to actually think about the stuff that I was doing in graduate school in ways that I'd never been forced to, to think about. But what it meant for Peg, Peggy Burns, Irish Catholic, um, Peggy Burns Deloria, Mm. which many people read as Italian, right, <laughs> was she found herself in the middle of all this kind of white ethnic stuff, which, so, you know, she'd go to these Italian guys and they'd be saying, like, why don't you use the, the beautiful name Deloria, you know? <laughs> why do you go by this Italian, why do you go by this Irish thing? What's up with that? And then, you know, she'd go to the Knights of Columbus and like, ah, <laughs> I taught her of the soil. <laughs> you know, so, so she was trying to navigate all of this stuff and she became really, really interested in kind of figuring it out and really, you know, got, got pretty good at it. So she learned to sell on the, in a super aggressive, masculinist, East Coast kind of, deal. She had a mentor, Sherry Price, who's still one of our best friends, you know, who um, Peg would come back. I remember this one day she came back from a sales call with Sherry Price and she's like, okay, you won't believe just what happened, right? So Sherry Price was of the Italian old school. Um, uh, she's like, we went in and this guy started yelling at Sherry. I'm like, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. She's like, and Sherry like leans over the table at him, looks him in the eye and says, and yells at him and says, like, are you mad at me? Are you mad at me? Hit me. Hit me right here. Hit me as hard as you can. And Sherry's yelling at this guy, hit me, hit me, hit me. And the guy's like, I'm not going to hit you. I'm going to, you know, and they were going back and forth. And Peg's like, this is how they do a sales call <laughs> in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> They're just like yelling at each other. You know, it's this crazy deal. And then there's this, and she's like, and then there's this moment when it all kind of breaks. And they kind of lean back and they just start laughing, you know? <laughs> and then they work it all out. And, it's, and, then they, and then they've got these understandings about how they work it all out. And um, Peg says, I walked out with Sherry later and I'm like, do you do this? Is this how you do it? Is this how it is here? And she's like, well, with some people, this is, you know, this is how you do it, you know? <laughs> so Peg learned how to sell in this super hardcore environment, you know? So she'd go in and she'd say, like, to these Italians, no me rompe caliones, right? Quit busting my balls. <laughs> you know, like, and then they would laugh and they would sign the deal, right? So, so she, like, acquired these skills um, that were kind of amazing. And I had a great time at Yale, played a lot of basketball. Um, <laughs> uh, not well, but played. Um, and then there's this moment in uh, 91... Yeah, 91, when Xerox in Denver called Peg and said, hey, you know, our senior high volume job, marketing executive job is open. This is selling like the world's biggest copiers, you know, is open. And Peg had kind of risen up through the ranks and become quite successful in New Haven. Her clients were Yale, Saab, which meant we drove, drove Saabs for a long time, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, you know, things like that. So. Um, so would you come back to Denver? So she's like, well, why don't we come back to, why don't we go back to Denver? Like, you've got two years of dissertation writing, but you don't have to be in New Haven. 
and here's this cool job, and we moved here for you. I'm like, absolutely, let's move right back. We moved right back into our house in Boulder, which we've been renting um, to a bunch of math nerds who were great tenants, usually. Um, so we moved back, and uh, uh, <laughs> I stayed behind in New Haven to do research in East Coast archives you know, mm -hmm. for the fall of that year. So I put Peg in the car with her dad. They drove back in kind of late August of 91. And we're thinking, this is going to be really great. We're going to go back into our house. Let, maybe let's get a dog. We'll do, you know, it'll be fun. And so on the road, Peg calls me, and she's like, oh, my God, I'm so sick. I can't believe it. We ate this steak at this place where my dad really wanted to go in Omaha, and I've just been throwing up. And you can see what's coming, right? And we got home, and the, she got home, and the renters had left the refrigerator, um, you know, full of rotting food and unplugged it on purpose. And so she opens the thing, and she throws it. She's like, oh, my God, the refrigerator was awful. I was throwing up. So then about a week later, she calls me and she's like, you got to sit down, it's, you know, because we're pregnant. So um, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this has been a really interesting kind of point for us. And like, I probably won't go into a ton of detail, but Peg's mom had taken DES. Mm -hmm. And so she was a DES baby. And so we were really worried about, um, you know, uh, how hard it was going to be. It was, we thought it was going to be hard for us to have kids. And, you know, we'd been together a long time, and frankly, we'd just been really sloppy, and, like, nothing had ever happened for us, you know. <laughs> um, but we had gone to a psychic on Nantucket in June, the, the, you know, the, the couple months before, who said, like, there's a child in your future. It will happen soon. And we're like, yeah, no, no, no. It's, when the time comes, we'll know, and we're going to have to work really hard with fertility specialists and people to make this happen. Like, we just understand that's our future. So it turns out, not our future. <laughs> so... Um, so here I am just starting my dissertation, and all of a sudden, you know, our son Jackson was born in May of uh, 1992. So, and I moved back to Colorado at that point and wrote my dissertation. And, uh, and Peg was like a shark in a tank of minnows. I mean, <laughs> like, you take like her kind of like Western informal vibe, and you put it together with like high-end East Coast sales skills, and a super smart financial mind. And like, she just like cut through Denver like a hot knife through butter, you know. She was just selling these giant copiers. So she was at one time the number one Xerox rep in the world. <laughs> in the oh. world. Wow. And she was twice the number one rep in the country and like eight times the number one rep in the Western US, you know. So, you know, so this is this, so Peg, my wife, has had this major kind of career you know, doing this stuff. And eventually then she moved into sales and marketing and she became the director of marketing for this kind of mount, mountain states area around Denver, Idaho, um, Utah. Um, and then Xerox did this really crappy thing, you know, mm -hmm. where they brought in a guy from IBM who wanted to like create silos. So he created all these different silos and in the process, this was really a job shedding kind of maneuver. So Peg had to try to like, talk some of her team into retirement, had to like move some people around. So she did all these creative moves to try to save everybody. And you know, um, I think she had to push one person to kind of go, go look, go look right now because you're not going to survive the cut, right? But every, and a couple of retirements and everybody else. She super creatively kind of found places for them. And when she finished that whole thing, Xerox said, oh, by the way, you're on the list of people to go. You know, so she had to reapply for this job, and she ended up with the Xerox job that, um, so stupid. This, we think corporate people are smart. They're not. They're stupid. <laughs> so she was doing graphic arts, marketing for the graphic arts division, this new thing, which meant every Monday she'd fly to Minneapolis, and then Tuesday on Houston, and then Seattle. And then L.A. And they couldn't even get the geographies right. It was like cold place, hot place, cold place, hot place. And then she'd get home on Friday. And she did that for about two months. She's like, I'm not doing this. So she took a month or two off. And while she was, well, she just left Xerox. And um, Sun Microsystems called her. And they said, ah, we hear you're available. So would you do global marketing, international marketing? So this was a super interesting, great job. And Sun was right in Boulder, you know, just right outside of Boulder, super close. And it was that moment when, like, you know, tech companies were, like, having bagel Wednesday and massages <laughs> Thursday afternoon, you know. So it was that moment, right, when it was like, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> so she went to work for Sun. Um, and, but she was only there through September of that year um, because that's when I moved to Michigan. 
and Michigan also, Michigan hired her at the same time, but really in a way before me. So she mm -hmm. went to Michigan as the um, assistant dean for marketing for the Liberal Arts College, College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. And then within a year, everybody had left Michigan, the president, provost, dean, et cetera, and they took the marketing, they took the development guy with them. And so Peg moved into, they f pulled those two things together. So it was a consolidation. So development and marketing, which turns out to be an advancement model, right? We actually coordinate across these things. So Peg built this advancement model in LSA, in our school, that was super successful. So when she started, I think the college had raised, I don't know, $13 million the mm -hmm. year before. And then <clears throat> her first year, they were up to 23. And by the time she finished, they were raising $125 million a year. She raised a billion dollars for the college over her time there, including a $57 million gift for creative writing. So she's really, really good, you know, <laughs> at, at what she does. And, um, you know, which makes a subsequent chapter of our life kind of sad, which, you know, I don't know, maybe we'll get to. In any case, yeah. Sure. So there I was, finished the dissertation, sitting around at Colorado, writing my dissertation. In the meantime, I wrote a coffee table book for Ted Turner, which was <laughs> really interesting and really fun. Wow. Um, and then uh, and I was on the job market. Mm. Interesting things happened. My parents' house burned. My dad had a house fire. My mom wasn't quite there yet. Um, she was still in Tucson. Um, I got an offer from the University of Nebraska. I was just so lucky. I just wrote a really, you know, dissertation that like hit people the right way at the right time, and um, you know, it became my first book, Playing Indian. Mm -hmm. So I had a job offer at the University of Nebraska and the University of Texas, and I had interviews at Michigan, Wisconsin, and Washington. So it was like, ah, oh, I just I wake up every day, as I still do. I just look in the mirror and I think, damn. You landed on your feet. I don't know how you did that. I don't know what happened, but this is like all good. I don't know how it's happened. But so interestingly, Colorado, which has never been a particularly effective institution, was very effective. And they said, here's a guy. He's adjunct teaching for us. He's living in town, right? We should just hire him. And he's got offers from peer institutions. And so they did. They put it together in like 10 days. I did a really quick job talk. They came back with an offer. And so then there I was at Colorado. <laughs> Amazingly, interestingly. Now, of course, you know who else was at Colorado? <laughs> My dad, <laughs> who had left Arizona and come back to Colorado. So we were in the same department together. Okay, I got to pause. <laughs> that okay. was like a lot of stuff. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, and we're, I don't know how much, let me check our time. Okay, yeah, we got, we got some time. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so the, it, can I ask just a little, because you spoke a little about um, the, uh, how did you, well, basically you spoke about some of what sort of got you into politics of sacred spaces and indigeneity and other things. Like, how did the dissertation kind of come together? Um, what, uh, yeah, I mean, like, where does that come from? Because that, that, I guess, is part of that. I, I see threads of playing Indian in Indians in unexpected mm -hmm. places and in, so it's, it seems like you kind of caught hold of a theme that you've been following. Um, yeah. yeah, sort of. I mean those two books happened in really, really different ways. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I was trying to figure out what to write, a dissertation project. I finished my exams and mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking I wanted to do something about Western identity and small towns and I had, it was a really vague idea, and my advisor, Bill Cronin, said, yeah, I don't know what your archive is for this. I don't know what your sources are for this. Mm. Like, you, you got to put more definition on this. So I was mm. TAing for him in environmental history, and he was talking about Ernest Thompson Seton and the Woodcraft Indians, mm. and I was sitting back there with Gunther Peck, labor historian at Duke um, now, and we were TAs for the class, mm. and Bill puts this picture of these kids dressed up like Indians on the screen. And Gunther Peck turns to me and he says, have you ever heard of this group called the Improved Order of Red Men? Because I was driving across Iowa and I saw this weird bar, this lodge for the Improved Order of Red Men. And I said, Gunther, I do know what this is because in growing up in Colorado, you, if you're you know, just a Colorado person, you ski at Winter Park. And if you ski at Winter Park, you drive down through Empire and you stop and you get a giant uh, milkshake. Uh, <laughs> and if you look off to your left from the milkshake place, there is this improved order of red men lodge. 
and I had seen that, and I was really curious about it, and I'd also at some point seen a kind of plan for it in the archives at the University of Colorado. Hmm. So I said, Gunther, I know exactly what the Improved Order of Red Men is. It's a fraternal society that dates back, you know, into the mid-19th century, and it's still functioning today, and it's a whole bunch of kind of crazy people who dress up like Indians, and I'm looking at this thing, and then I'm thinking, Boston Tea Party, Boulder, where every New Age hippie dresses up like an Indian, um, and like the book literally flashed in my head and unfolded most of it in about 30 seconds. I was like, oh, there's a chapter on the Boston Tea Party, right? And what's that about? It's about, you know, it's, that's about the revolution. And what's the revolution? And uh, that's a, yet to be worked out yet. But then you've got like stuff after the revolution with the improved order of red men and this kind of fraternal thing. I didn't quite have the Lewis Henry Morgan chapter down, but interestingly, Alan Trachtenberg had been telling me, you should work on Lewis Henry Morgan. And I was like, I want to work on Frederick Remington. You know, but, in any case, that Lewis Henry Morgan ended up quickly coming into the picture. Um, and, I th and then there's this whole thing with the Woodcraft Indians and Campfire Girls and Boy Scouts. And I was in Boy Scouts and I was in the Order of the Arrow, so I actually knew about the Indian thing in Boy Scouts. And then, and then there's all these hippies in Boulder. And it's like this big longitudinal history held together by the theme of white Americans dressing up like Indians and making meaning out of it and taking something deep. I mean, like the conceptual apparatus was, it just exploded in my head. I've never had anything like it. It was great. It was incredible. And I walked out of there, I'm like, damn, I know exactly what my dissertation is. And then it was a question of kind of filling in the pieces and then doing the research and, and all of that. And, um, you know, so, um, yeah. Um, so there it was. Now, the interesting thing about it was after the book came out, you know, it's an American studies book. It's about mm. Americans. It's not really about Indians that much. And mm. people started saying, where's the Indians in the book? I'm like, well, the creeks are in there at the beginning, and then there's this thing with the hobbyists, and you know, but there's not, but it's not about Indians, you know, it's really not about Indians. Um, so, but I was interested in that question, right? Like, how do Indians interact with the ideological structures that are built around and about them? Um, so, at that I, at, when I was at Yale, I worked at the Beinecke Library. Um, uh, for George Miles, who's a curator there, and it was great, you know, and I just, part of the deal was, you do this stuff, and then if you just disappear in the archives for, you know, in the stacks for a couple hours, no problem, just don't steal anything, right? But like, if you want, so, you know, I would end up looking at all this great stuff, this super interesting and cool stuff, and at some point, uh, I ended up looking at these roadmaps and they all had these kind of Indians and cars thing going on. And I kind of got curious about this, about the idea about Indians buying and owning cars. And of course, since I had been into Austin music, I knew Michael, Mur Michael Murphy's song, Geronimo's Cadillac. And so I had a kind of a germ of an idea about Indians and cars kind of floating around. Um, and then, in 1990, my grandfather died. He had Alzheimer's. My grandmother died later that year. Um, and I had this moment that I recount in the, in the book where I come to visit him and I'm saying, oh, I'm from Connecticut, and he goes into this football story. And I had this revel little, little flash of a revelation, right? Like, oh, my grandfather really, if I, if I don't read the Alzheimer's metaphorically, mm -hmm. right, or as just random, if I read it as something that's a serious expression, right, what he's saying, I read him as an athlete, not as a minister, um, and not as an ethnographic informant or anything mm -hmm. like that. So I read him as an athlete, and what would it mean to read him as an athlete? And then within a month, there were two, these two obituaries in the Lakota Times for in, other Indian guys who'd been athletes. And I realized, like, I would have blown right by them, mm -hmm. you know. Went to Holy Rosary Mission School, played two years of semi-pro baseball in Phoenix, you know, was a rancher in Wombly for the rest of his life. It's like, I never would have, but because I'd been thinking about my grandfather, I'm like, wait a minute. How do you get to be playing semi-pro baseball in Phoenix, you know, for two years of your life? And then another guy who was on the Sioux Travelers, like, what's Sioux Travelers? What is that? You know, I got to figure that out. So now I had another cluster of stuff around my grandfather and around sports, and that was the first piece that I wrote for that book. And I did the Cars thing as a conference paper. Um, and then I'd been carrying around this music thing for a long time, right? I'd been thinking about, like, da 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 like, what's the semiotics of sound? that you know, produced that as like a sound of Indian. So I had that thing floating around, and I had been friends for a long time with Chanina Lomawema, mm -hmm. whose great aunt is Chanina Blackfeather, um, Blackstone, Redfeather. <laughs> I get them all confused at this point. It's been a while. Um, and so at one point I had a conversation. I'm like, tell me about your great aunt. 
She's like, oh, she was really interesting, and she was great, she was a musician. And so now I have all these things kind of floating around, and I thought, I want to teach a course on like weird Indian stuff. Mm -hmm. So I started gathering up other things. So I had this Pawnee roller skating champion from 1912, and an Indian guy who did pole sitting in the 1920s, and I'm like, how can I build a class around all this stuff, you know, that would be fun? <laughs> and I, um, I had a friend who was an editor at University Press of Kansas, Nancy Jackson, and she and I had this really wonderful kind of productive relationship where I would funnel my grad students to her and she would talk them through the publishing process. And she was hoping to get books out of them and none of them ever really published with her, but she was so generous with them. I always felt indebted to her. And, you know, um, so one night at a conference we were sitting down and we were having dinner and she said, you know, uh, all this stuff you've been talking about for this class, this is a book. I'm like, no, it's not a book. She's like, no, that thing and this thing and this thing, you put them together and it's a book. So I didn't really even see it. And so she, as an editor, <laughs> saw it. And so it was this laborious kind of process then for that book of kind of pulling together a couple of random conference papers that I thought were one-offs, interesting one-offs, into a kind of theoretical structure. Um, and that was the kind of moment in my classes when students were like, I know, that's stereotype, that's bias. And I got so crabby at them thinking like, because they'd say that and then they'd sit back and go like, you know, give me a pellet. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you don't get a pellet for that, that's not sparked. <laughs> so I felt like I had to do something that would speak to those students, right? That would get them off the language of stereotype, right? And that would actually make a kind of theoretical sort of intervention. Um, so that's how I went into the book. And I came out of the book thinking like, I got a whole bunch of really cool Indian people who are doing really cool stuff. Why aren't they having dinner together? You know, why aren't they a community? And I really pressed hard to try to see if I could establish an argument that they were a community, that mm -hmm. they did more than the occasional cross-country gaze at one another. And I really couldn't really prove that, unfortunately. The bad thing, the downside of that book, right, um, mm -hmm. is that when I got to Michigan, um, I was able to move pretty fast on pulling that together. And uh, I ended up in a situation where I had to be the chair. I had to be the chair of my department. And so they gave me one more semester. They're, they said, you've got to be promoted to full. I'm like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me one more semester to finish that book. And then they made me chair. And so I didn't really get the book finished. Mm -hmm. So if you notice, there's a chapter on film, mm -hmm. which doesn't use any Southern California film archives. And like, that's, so it's an unfinished chapter basically, that like I just had to do the best I could using motion picture world. And it's, you know, people who know the field understand that that chapter is incomplete. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's how these things go sometimes, though. Um, yeah. It, well, and so, so are you trying, do you have any plans to finish that chapter in something else? Or is that kind of that nah. you're done with it's that. done okay. now really good people have d taken up film mm -hmm. and like they've blown right by me so that's like each of those chapters I said in the book each mm -hmm. of those chapters could be a book in unto itself mm -hmm. and now a couple people have written the film book already so I'm not I got other stuff I'm not gonna revisit that so if I I don't know how much you would want to share but I know you've thought about writing more about your family and some other things is there anything you could share about that because that does seem like a thread that at least a piece of it is kind of in that book. Yeah. I mean, there's something about my family in every, every one of my books, right? Yeah. So in Playing Indian, there's this little moment where Ella, my great aunt, mm -hmm. comes in. And then, of course, you know, my grandfather really does structure a lot of the um, Unexpected Places book that, around that essay. So, I mean, I have been really interested in um, my grandparents. And it's, you know, it's a little hard to write about your grandparents, you know, when there's a bigger kind of constellation of family members who also have interests in the, you know, in, in that generation of people. But lots of people want me to write about my father, mm. um, and I'm less interested in doing that, right? There's um, three Davids, David Wilkins, David Temmons, and David Martinez, all writing biographies, intellectual or political sort of thought biographies of my dad. So, I, you know. I don't want to jump into that. But my grandparents' generation is interesting to me. My, my grandmother, um, and we were talking about the ways that my mom is often subsumed beneath my father. My grandmother was subsumed beneath my grandfather. Mm. But her family is really interesting. Um, you know, so there's a Deloria family treaty 
Mm -hmm. It comes from my grandmother's side. Um, you know, and it's the treaty that founds the town that would become Slotesburg, New York. Mm -hmm. And so my grandmother's family is like a deeply colonial colonizing family. They sign an Indian treaty and take, have land. Um, mm -hmm. They own slaves. They start the Mexican-American War. Um, not in the literal mm -hmm. sense, but almost, right? When the Pacific Fleet f sails into California, it's commanded by John Drake Sloat, who's one of the Sloats. Um, you know, they're in the Revolutionary War. Uh, they dam up the Ramapo River, create an industrial working class, and exploit the hell out of them, right? They are reliant upon southern cotton to build a twine manufacturing kind of plant. They're part of American industrialists. So that family is a super interesting family that has a lot to say. And there's an irony sort of embedded in the two families coming together, right? So I've written about this, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that you've got, you've got this family, which is sort of like really representative of American colonialism in all different kinds of forms and dominations over other people and, you know, class and race and gender, all of that stuff comes into play. And then you've got, you know, my grandfather's family, which is sort of French guys and Indians sort of mixing it all up. And, you know, and the fact that those two would come together and marry is, is to me a kind of a point of articulation for thinking about big historical kinds of you know, issues and questions. So I've always wanted to kind of pursue that and I've also wanted to pursue it in relation to my grandfather's two sisters, Ella and Susie. Um, mm -hmm. Because Ella you know, is theorizing culture and culture transmission as she's working with Franz Boas. At the same time, she's watching her brother marry my white grandmother, mm -hmm. this super colonizing kind of family. So there's a kind of a tension that is introduced that when you triangulate the three of them, right, their intellectual and sort of social and cultural and personal lives rub against each other, right? So it's always felt to me like that was an interesting kind of story. What I've sort of done with that, because I'm mm -hmm. actually sort of, you know, not really thinking about that right now, but I've thought a lot about the other sister, Susie, mm -hmm. Um, who's an artist, and this is actually the project that I'm going to, will hopefully be out in a year and a half or so, um, uh, you know, who trails Ella around everywhere she goes um, and produces this interesting body of art, 134 images that are based on the personalities of famous people in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. It looks unlike any other piece of Indian art, right? So this is a moment of explosion of Indian art, and it's like flat, perspective, two-dimensional, right, traditional subject matter, Santa Fe School, Kiowa Five, you know, this kind of stuff, primitivist stuff for a primitivist kind of audience. And what Susie does is completely modernist, engaged with the modernists of Europe and America in the 19-teens and 20s, and, um, but has a deeply indigenous sensibility about it, right, and a sense of futurity, and I think a smart sense of engagement with all of the things that Ella was doing around race, intelligence testing, uh, theorizing culture, ethnography, language preservation. So my, part of my argument in this book is that like, it's really easy to kind of hold up Ella as this kind of amazing sort of post-colonial anthropological kind of figure, but much of her production sits in relation to the production of her sister, who's doing it on the artist, an artistic version, an aesthetic version of the ethnographic stuff and the linguistic stuff that Ella's doing. So this is where my energies around family history have been trans translated for the moment. Okay, that's fascinating. Um, okay, so that gives me a couple questions. But one, do you have any personal memories of your aunts that you would want to share? Or Well, I have no memories of Susie. She okay. died in the early 60s. Okay. Um, and I have not many memories of Ella. Um, you know, um, those would date from kind of the, well, early 70s, right? Because she died in 73. Must have been like right, must have been right after we moved back from Washington State. I mean, I have this memory of her coming to visit us mm -hmm. you know, sort of one mm -hmm. time. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't well, you know, it's, I mean, so, so my main memory of her is not of sort of an active intellectual kind of figure, as, which she was for much of her life but more as a person sort of in a state of decline and my dad sort of trying to, you know, be, and my mom trying to be good, you know, good to her. Yeah. So it's not much of a memory really, no. unfortunately. Understandable, it's yeah. how these things go sometimes. Um, but so the, and 
your work overall, at least I think, has been very influential in kind of helping to to look at Indians as innovators, and I mean to to really try to deconstruct the uh, static primitivist kind of a- approach to viewing uh, native culture that just gets embedded in the American consciousness. I guess like. Is there a point that you can point to where you sort of became aware that that was something you wanted to do? Mm -hmm. Um, Because from the way you framed it, at least, it doesn't seem like growing up you were thinking a lot about that. So at what point do you start thinking that that's what you want to articulate, or part of what you want to articulate? I don't want to reduce it to that. Yeah. Some, some big part of it does actually, I think, go back to those sort of, those kind of revelatory moments about my grandfather. Mm-hmm. And sort of thinking, okay, wait a minute, you know, so when you do like a New York Times search, you know, for him, which, you know, I mean, you just type him into ProQuest, what you get is a whole series of box scores for football mm-hmm. games. And there's a lot of them. And he's kind of playing all over the place. And what, you, what I kind of realized was like, you know, he liked New York, I mean, and, and once you kind of get the affect of his affection for New York, right, in your head, then it, to me it sort of opens up this sort of sensibility, right, um, that is both temporal, right, like you say, I mean, it's like, I'm going to say this in my talk later today, right, it's baked into the bones and the blood of Americans that Indians do not exist in the, in the past or in, the pres- in our present. They do not exist in modernity. It's just like, and people can say intellectually that they believe Indians are, contemporaneous with us in modern, but they don't really get it, you know? It's like you have to go meta, 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 meta on them. You have to press, 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 press to try to really push that kind of idea. Most people aren't willing to dig that deep, I don't think. Um, so my sense, you know, and that is linked to a spatial kind of, a spatialization as well, which is mm. like, you know, the reservation is the home space of Indian people. It's like, mm, not so much. As far as I can tell, my grandfather, like, would have traded New York City for South Dakota kind of any day and like made it just like part of his life. It's one of the reasons I love James Welch's last book, The Heart Song of Charging Elk, where he sort of puts Charging Elk in France and gives him a choice to come back with Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show and he leaves him in France. Right? It's like this is to be you know, modern and contemporaneous, right? to actually live a life. So I think you know, with my grandfather, that was definitely part of it. And then you know, hearing, thinking more about my great-grandfather, um, mm-hmm who, you know, was, they called him the Phillips Brooks of the Episcopal Church, and Phillips Brooks was a big famous Episcopal orator. And so what they do with my great-grandfather was they take him on these big speaking fundraising tours, both my grandfather and my great-grandfather, all up and down the East Coast, and he'd go in and he'd give sermons at these churches and he'd raise money. So it's like these are Indian people who are on real circuits of mobility, you know, they yeah. are cosmopolitan, um, and they engage it, you know. They don't see, I think the part of the problem is to say modernity. Right? When you say modernity, you're introducing this kind of a Western temporal concept, and it's got this super bright line. Now, we don't know where the bright line is, right? You know, is it an epistemological crisis that's generated by Kant and other philosophers, right? Or is it an aesthetic crisis generated by Baudelaire, right? I mean, there's all these ways of kind of having a slippery line around modernity, but, but Western sort of intellectual thought is always willing to make it a bright line, even if it's flexible and movable. Mm-hmm. But my sense about it is, like, you have to think that, like, Indian people may have perceived white people's under, temporal understanding of modernity and worked it, but they did not actually see an epochal break around modernity. To say that, right, is to imagine Indian disappearance, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, like, one of the most important things to do, what I've come to believe, is to imagine, like, right now we talk a lot and think a lot about Indian futurity, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, people who are into like there's people inter- interested in thinking about like you know science fiction and comic books and graphic novel and all the forms that we want to associate with futurity that represent futurity and we have to give the historical people of the past that same sort of ability to think futurity not to think like from now where the sun now stands I will fight no more forever then the buffalo was gone and nothing else happened right it's like people have said that those were rhetor- powerful rhetor- rhetorical strategies because they meant a lot to white Americans who listened to them yeah. But for every person who says that, there's an Indian person who, for whom modernity means nothing. They're just trying to make lives in relation to conditions of desperation. Desperation doesn't have to define their temporal condition. So I've, I've come to see that in part through thinking about my grandfather, my great-grandfather. I think the Buffalo Bill thing, 
was super important. There was a kind of flash moment where I was realized, like, um, hmm. damn, Buffalo Bill hired these people for 30 years. That's like a generation and a half, you know, um, of people who are wage actors, who travel the world, right? Who are better traveled than some of the rednecks, ranchers who were sitting next to them in South Dakota, right? So who's more cosmopolitan? And then that translated, in that book, you can see how mm -hmm. then that translates into everything else. Oh, and these Indians are buying cars. They maybe bought more cars than white people did, right? What, and so all of a sudden you kind of open up this sort of thing around Indians being modern. And then for me, there's also this kind of temptation in some post-colonial theory to say, well, we have alternative modernities, mm -hmm. or we have uneven modernities that happened at different times for different people. And I kind of get the sort of theoretical argument about that. But for me, it's kind of like, it's more important to say, the political stakes are higher to say, like, if you want to claim something as modernity, and we're all in it together, right? And, and Indians are part of it too, right? Now, interestingly, my friend Mark Rifkin opens his new book on Indian temporality with a huge critique of my argument. Um. <laughs> and I think he's right, actually, right? He's saying, like, to say modern, even to say that, is to sort of, like, if to, to make the argument Indians are part of modernity is to accept a kind of settler tempor temporality, mm -hmm. right? You know, so. But it feels to me like the intellectual and the political stakes are actually, all arguments are contingent, and that's a contingent argument that I think actually matters, and still matters, and certainly mattered 10 years ago. There's my defense of myself. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so this might be an idiosyncratic question because it's one that's just kind of bugged me. But the two worlds, the, the way that it's always framed, you see, you still commonly see um, I, Indians in modernity framed as people trapped between two worlds. You know, I mean, your dad famously critiqued that, and, but it still is there. I mean, all these people walking by on the street right now probably have that in their mindset. Yeah. But I also noticed in um, Indians in Unexpected Places, you talk about, you know, your grandfather's world. And uh, I mean, there, there are other ways of conceiving of worlds. Do you, what is that world, I guess? It, or what's, what's the utility of a word like world? Yeah. Um, or what's the language to use? Because that, that's part of, what I think makes it hard, what I think, you, you are free to challenge me as much as you'd like, but just finding the language to challenge these things is so difficult because it's so embedded and it so easily be, becomes elided with things that were exactly the opposite of what you wanted to say. I, yeah. I've, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly the problem, right? It's like, You've got, you know, Two Worlds 1.0 and Two Worlds 2.0. Mm. And Two Worlds 1.0 is like, he was trapped between two worlds. He was the lost man. He was floating in space. Like, I just taught, um, I've been teaching, I'm teaching Alexi and Mama Day, you know, kind of mm. together. And so I was reading parts of House Made of Dawn, and I've got mm. the, my edition from 1970, which is exactly this kind of deal, you know. He no longer welcomed in the Indian culture, not accepted by the white people. He was a man lost, blah, 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 <laughs> right? So, so it, this is exactly, I think, how people want to see it. So there's 1.0. Now, for, now for me, 2.0, and the challenge is how you kind of get people to think rigorously enough to understand 2.0, which is hard because it's a different, this is not dialectical, right? This is dialectical. 2.0 is dialectical. And I mean, the way I've been structuring my intro class right now is around that dialectic, which is to say, we're going to spend the first two thirds of the class talking about sovereignty. And sovereignty itself is a dialectical kind of concept. So we've got a dialectic within a dialectic, right? So sovereignty, you know, maybe has kind of indigenous precedence, but the concept itself is a Western concept. We totally admit it. We cop to it. It's, it's completely fine. Sovereignty is constituted through a whole bunch of different kinds of mechanisms which are Western in form, but which require certain kinds of indigenous participation and shaping, right? So treaties, laws, et cetera, et cetera. The development of tribal councils, post-IRA, all of these kinds of things, right, are expressions of sovereignty, um, which are to be real in the world, useful to Indian people, mm. right? Now, in relation to that, you've got the anti-sovereignist argument, right, of Tayake, Alfred, or people like that, who are like, mm, not a Western concept, not useful to us. We actually have our own indigenous kinds of concepts that we might apply to that. And that leads you to the second sort of piece of the dialectic, the other third of the class, which is like indigenousness. Mm -hmm. So 
And this is how Elizabeth Cook Lynn framed the field back in her essay about who stole Native American studies, you know, back in the day, right? To say, okay, now if we, if we think about indigenousness as a kind of autochthonous, this is the word I've been using because I like to say autochthonous. If you think that there is in fact a world, a core, a kind of um, thing which is constantly recreated um, in the way that culture right, reproduces itself even as it transforms, right? Mm -hmm. The river and the water, all those kind of metaphorical things. That there is in fact a kind of coherence about indigenousness, which indigenous people continue to reproduce constantly without any recourse to thinking about that, yeah. you know? And then you think, okay, if I accept that, I mean, Paul Chat Smith has been saying this a lot lately, you know? He's like, you know, Indian people lived lives and did things that were mostly concerned with other Indian people that paid no attention to this other stuff, right? Th that's what it is. And it's a little hard to wrap words and definitions around it. But if you think, okay, that sits itself, right, in relation to this kind of other sort of dialectical thing which has dialectics within it, it that's really complicated. But I think that's a structure that starts to describe more accurately. But as you say, the danger is like, are you going to come with me on that little journey, or are you going to fall back into like he was trapped between two worlds, right? It's it's kind of hard. But when I say my grandfather's world in some ways, I want to evoke. I mean, and I probably wasn't as clear on that then as I am now. I want to evoke both this kind of indigenous thing, right? This not the right word, right? The core, mm -hmm. uh, centrality, uh, autochthonous thing, a thing that is reproduced that is remains native, um, you know, and which exists on and, and for itself, and which exists in relation to and in opposition to all that bad stuff that also happened. And then sovereignty as a kind of dialectical concept, right, which is always engaged with that thing that is indigenous, right? So it has to be about lots of motion back and forth between the concepts, right? And it requires, I think, a real supple kind of thinking to do that, and I'm not saying I actually have it, because you can tell I'm, I struggle mm -hmm. to articulate it you know, myself. But it feels like that describes the real li conditions of life in some ways. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, because I wonder, you're talking about sovereignty, which of course is loaded and very Western, but so is culture, and a lot of the other words that by default we try to use to counter it, and that's, that's what's really that's one of the things I've appreciated, especially about your work, is trying to not look at Indian culture. I mean, first of all, there are you know, multiple Indian cultures, but what is that culture? How does it kind of, um, it, I guess the best way to put it succinctly would be when you talked about, I think it was epistemological simultaneity. It, yeah, but I mean, that's really yeah. it though, right? That's because totally it. people want to, there's this tendency to want it to reduce it to the one thing, mm -hmm. and it can be more than one thing at a time. I, and I sort of got the impression you, on some level, kind of learned that through your family and your experiences growing up. That you're like you're. I I haven't seen you describe your your grandfather seems to have been traditional, but very Christian, which mm -hmm. already some people would want to drive a wedge right. between those. Right. You know, unapologetically, if you want to call it modern or if that temporalizes him, I'm not trying. But, and it, I don't get a sense that he, he or anyone else in your family tried to transmit some sense of like internal conflict about right. that to you. So, is there anything you could say in terms of like, in terms of that, in terms of how you're, uh, your life and growing up sort of affected that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I think that's a really um, smart observation. Um, it is a sort of sense, right, that, um, I mean, there's a, there is a way in which the weirdness of my family, right? Like, mm. how does a family kick up so many people who have, you know, so much achievement? I don't, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm the last of the lot and the least of the lot, right? I mean, some of these folks, I mean, they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, and how do those people live their lives without, like you say, without a kind of, at least a public kind of sense of contradiction or apology, you know, mm. for 
being complicated, you know. No, they just live their lives and they just do their thing, right, in a lot of ways. And they're, they're mostly confident about it, you know. I mean, I'm the least confident about this of anybody, you know, everybody in my family. I mean, so I'd say, um, so for me, it comes, this comes from two different, well, there's two different elements of this. One is it, come, it, it also comes from, I gotta say, you know, in the dissertation and mostly gone from the book is, um, it comes from reading Walter Benjamin, actually, mm. the German sort of theorist, who, you know, actually got inside my head I mean, I feel like I understood both Dakota epistemology and this kind of thing of epistemological simultaneities through reading Benjamin mm -hmm. um, in a pretty serious way with a really smart kind of person guiding me because you really need a person looking over your shoulder to read Benjamin, you know, well. And I'm not saying I've read it well, but I read it as well as I could. Um, you know, to understand the, the relationship between, I mean, for him there's a linearity to time, right? And there's a sort of sacred time, which has a kind of, you know, Edenic and, uh, you know, kind of revelatory kind of quality, right? Beginning of time and end of time in a sacred time, which is also everywhere, right? Which has no temporality to it, right? So it's like, okay, I got to think hard to wrap my head around that. And then within that, you know, there is historical time and historicist time, right? And part of Benjamin's whole theory was to move against historicist time that just moves, but to jump up, to find moments to jump up into sacred time, right? Into this other sort of temporal. And if and if the moment of revelation is implicit in every, in coming out of Jewish tradition, if the moment of revelation is implicit in every other moment of time, then I can stand in this moment and I can imagine the fullness of knowledge that is available at this moment, at the moment of redemption, right? Redemption and not, is not revelation is the word I've been mm -hmm. sort of trying to think of that starts with R. <laughs> uh, so, so part of Benjamin's theory was like, in this moment, I'm able to capture, th there's moments, there's things that happen, the flash, you know, danger. Um, you know, that allow me to see this, this particular kind of time. And that, to me, started to describe, right, the relationships that I was sort of seeing and imagining and remembering as people talked about Dakota epistemologies, right? That you live in this world, but you have total access to this world if you're able to do it right. You know, if you're able to kind of, for Benjamin, it's like, how do I put together the constellation of dialectical image that will produce the flash, right? But you imagine a different tradition, a Dakota tradition, right, um, in which access through medicine, through ceremony, through ritual is available to you, right, to this other time. And all of a sudden you've got different sort of temporalities going, different epistemological kinds of, you know, kinds of possibilities. Um, so now I take that and I kind of imagine how people think of that in historical kinds of terms or in the terms of sovereignty or indigeneity, the kind of more mundane terms really in relation mm. to this, right, and all of a sudden you get this kind of world of complication, right, that, that opens up you know, opens up possibilities, I think, opens up possibilities to you. So for me, it was a deep dive into that. But I also say, like, on the private side, you know, I mean, all these people who have so much achievement, right, in the family, um, they also all have their own private kinds of anxieties, mm -hmm. right, about, you know, the ways in which, um, and these have nothing to do with a lack of confidence in the structure that I've just outlined. Mm. They have to do with the social conditions under which, you know, Indianness is constituted and performed and measured and quantified. And, you know, it's like, is it blood quantum or descent? Is it, do you have a language or not? Is it, do you live in a reservation or do you live in Golden, Colorado? Is it, it's all of those different kinds of things. Are you working for Franz Boas or are you hanging out and helping your people? Is it, so every one of those generations, I think, has kind of fought through this stuff. And I mean, for me, it's, it's been most visible in thinking about the ways that like my great grandfather ended up trying to raise my grandfather, right? Mm -hmm. So he, that's the point, right, at which his life was, hey, all the uncles are getting all the kids, all the boys up at five in the morning and we're gonna run down and jump in the stream and then we're gonna have aggressive play that's gonna train us to be warriors and hunters, right? I mean, he has a memory, he had a memory of that. And then he found himself, right, in the church, living in a square house, and there's no uncles around, right? I mean, there's a few, but they're living over here and they're living over here. There's not that communal kind of life. And now he, as a father, has to try to raise a son 
fulfilling all the other kinship roles that would have been there, right? A good uncle, a bad uncle, right? Uncle that's going to, and a father, I mean, in the old days, a father who could just give you unconditional love and didn't have to discipline you. But if you've got a bad uncle to smack you around when you do something bad, then you've got a good uncle to explain everything to you, right? <laughs> and now we're sitting in a house and you have to fill all those roles. And how would you do that? I mean, and to do it in one generation, right? And so what ends up happening, I think, at least in some of the things that I understand about our family, is none of the fathers do that very well as they pass it down to the sons. And there's moments that look like, you know, forms of abuse between generations because, you know, of those things. And those things then create these kinds of anxieties about whether you're good enough relative to the previous generation, whether you're real enough, whether you're authentic enough, you know. So I think my dad had it in relation to my grandfather. I think I had it in relation to my dad. I don't think my son really has it that much in relation to me, at least not around Indianness, just because, you know, I mean, last three generations have married white people, you know. So he doesn't have it in the same kind of way, um, I think, that my dad had, you know. And if, if I had been like my brother or sister and just gone into a profession, I probably wouldn't have worried about it either. But, you know, I'm now I'm always in an academic context and people know my dad and they know his work and they're like, well, you're, you know, how come you don't look more like your dad, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, I worried a lot about that in my early career. And there was moments where I felt like I had to kind of try to perform something that was some more picture of authentic Indianness. And, but you know, it's never good enough. Yeah. People who care about that will never make them happy, you know? <laughs> and you just look stupid, right? So it's like, no, I'll just do what I do. Um, yeah. <laughs> enough. Well, I, th I think we're running out of time here if we're not already, uh, yeah, pretty much out of time. Otherwise, there are, um, I, I will say in response to that, though, I really liked how you, uh, the line, uh, Red Cloud Woman's personal history of modernity will remain as, it just thinking of her personal history of modernity, I, it, it kind of uh, helps to, to my mind, uh, describe some of what you were just talking about. I don't, I, I'm guessing that's sort of the kind of thing running through your head at the time. Um, but do you have any final thoughts or comments you would want to share or? Uh, no, I don't, okay. I, probably not. Uh, yeah, okay. thanks. Fair it's enough. been, um, I'm, I'm probably just got going and sort of on all kinds of weird tangents and that, stuff. I hope somebody finds it useful sometime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much. Um,